we're going to be looking in this series of, vi of videos at the question of Jesus' resurrection, one of the great questions of all history. But in order to get a handle on that question, we need to ask first, who was Jesus? And what do we know about him? What was his life all about? Why did he die? And all those questions that cluster around that. So in this first video, we're going to be looking at that whole issue of Jesus himself. And that is, of course, something that's been enormously controversial, actually, particularly in North America recently. I've mm. noticed coming over from the UK that to raise the question of who was Jesus is at once to, to send a signal that all sorts of other questions are on the table as well. It acts as a kind of a lightning rod for that, uh, for, for many other issues in the North American culture and I think in Western culture more widely. So it's perhaps not surprising that over the last century really, but then particularly just the last 10 or 20 years, there's been a great deal of discussion and speculation and historical argument uh, was Jesus just a great moral teacher? Was he uh, a great hero of faith, a great leader? Um, was he a doom and gloom apocalyptic prophet saying the world was going to end uh, in, in the next day or hour or week? Or was he simply at a more cooler level a teacher of spirituality or somebody who was offering a new way of going to heaven or something like that? All those have been tried and uh, people have written great books about them and more recently in the last um, 10 or a dozen years we've seen particularly in North America several different writers and movements uh, who have tried to argue that Jesus had nothing whatever to do with apocalyptic and all that end of the world stuff or conversely that that's precisely what he was mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and uh, there's been a lot of debate and discussion about all of that and I have had fun taking part in that debate myself. Now. As a historian, I think what I want to say about Jesus runs something like this. We can be most secure in talking about Jesus when we begin by saying that he was a first century Jewish prophet announcing the kingdom of God. And each little bit of that is kind of important. Uh, of course, I want to go on to say that Jesus was much more than that, mm -hmm. but that he wasn't any less. Uh, he was a prophetic figure and was perceived as that and was happy when people talked of him as a prophet. Um, and uh, as a prophet, he was starting or leading some kind of a movement, and mm -hmm. lots of other people did that. You know, you don't yeah. have to say, does this mean he was founding a church with mm. buildings and processions <laughs> right. and robes and so on? <laughs> uh, you know, people did lead movements in the first century and start saying things that were slightly different, and, and that, right. uh, mm -hmm. that's what we know about Jesus. But then this kingdom of God business, people get so bothered about that. Uh, what is the kingdom of God? In Jesus' day, it was a revolutionary slogan. Yeah. It meant yeah. that God was going to be king in a way which meant that Caesar and Herod mm -hmm. pretty certainly weren't right. anymore. Yeah. It was a way of saying we want God alone to be our master, our king, our ruler. And uh, that's fine. People sometimes say, well, wasn't God always king? Wasn't God always the ruler of the world? And well, the answer to a Jew is, well, he was and he wasn't, you know. Uh, there's a sense in which, of course, God is ruling. But if God is ruling, why are all these bad things happening to us, to Israel, to the world, etc.? And so Jesus, in coming in saying, now is the time, is offering not just good advice about how to live your life or about how to go to heaven when you die or whatever, yeah. but good news. That's the big distinction, I think, in contemporary scholarship about Jesus, that a lot of people are basically turning Jesus into some, somebody who's offering good advice. Mm -hmm. And as I see it, Jesus is saying, no, something is happening. It's mm -hmm. news. And you've got to get on board with the thing that's happening. And Jesus' kingdom announcement was then made through all these parables, which are not just you know, neat, timeless teaching <laughs> turned into prepackaged stories for kids who can't understand the abstract theory. It's not like that. He's telling a story about something that's happening. Mm -hmm. Only the trouble is it's not quite what his hearers had expected. So mm -hmm. he's constantly saying, yeah, the thing that you were wanting to happen is happening, but it, it doesn't look quite like you thought it would. And so there's a clash always between Jesus and some of the expectations of the people around him and some of the symbols which they expect to accompany the kingdom the way they see it. Yeah. Um, for instance, the Sabbath and the food laws, they expect that when the kingdom comes, it will reaffirm the, the, uh -huh. the, the sort of Judaism they know. And Jesus is saying, no, it's bigger than that. It's different. It's more explosive than that. It's going out beyond. And all of that reaches a climax when Jesus, towards the end of his public career, which is very short, 
mm -hmm. arrives in Jerusalem for the last time and does this dramatic thing in the temple which seems to say here is a claim being staked and when we look in the historical context and say what sort of person comes to Jerusalem and does something dramatic like this in mm. the temple it's a royal thing it's a king sort of thing it's a messiah sort of thing and yet Jesus isn't quite the sort of messiah that some might have been expecting so there's a, again a, an odd edge to this is he the messiah or isn't he and then as we look at what Jesus is doing in the temple and in Jerusalem, it appears that in going up to Jerusalem, he has a different agenda again. He's not going up in order to sit on a throne and be king in the way that his followers seem to have expected. You know, they want him to be number one, and they're going to get the top jobs around him in, 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 this, in this coming regime. Rather, Jesus really seems to believe, uh, I think, and I've argued this in detail in some of my work, uh, that it is his vocation to be a different sort of messiah, uh, a sort of messiah which will end with his own death. And he seems to be plugging into many of those Jewish traditions about martyrdom and about redemptive suffering, which go back through some of the martyrs of the previous generations in his world through to the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. And so Jesus, I believe, knew that it was his vocation to come and be that sort of a messiah and to claim his sort of kingdom through his own suffering and death. Mm. Now, that's all very well. Mm -hmm. Clearly, his followers were not on board with this. This was not their agenda at all. And so the question that then is posed for us and for any historian of the first century, and it's the question we're going to be looking at throughout mm. the series of videos, is why then did Christianity begin? Because after all, there were lots of other messianic or prophetic movements within a century or so either mm -hmm. side of Jesus mm -hmm. that ended with the violent death of the founder. And nobody the next day said, oh, he really was the Messiah and we must go on following him in, in, in some sense. So that'll be the question that will launch us into the, uh, the other videos in this series. But for this first one, we just need to take some time then and reflect on what was this kingdom of God? Does it make sense? So, mm -hmm. how does this all strike you? What, what questions do you have arising out of all of this? As a parish pastor, that phrase, kingdom of God, is always curious, trying to make that relevant for today since mm -hmm. we don't live with kings and queens or kingdom, <laughs> right, and right. trying to understand for folks to say, when Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, right. uh, how, what does that mean? Because there's political elements when sure. Jesus spoke mm -hmm. that, but some sure. of the words that we use now don't fit politically. Yes, uh, and, and actually when people say this to me as a Brit, you know, we do have a queen, right. we've had exactly. kings, we've another yeah. king. Um, actually, that makes it harder, not easier, because yes. um, the sort of monarchy that we have is a modern constitutional mm -hmm. monarchy and is totally unlike mm -hmm. Caesar or Herod in the first century, mm -hmm. so that we all have to make that leap back. Mm -hmm. um, there aren't too many regimes which are exactly like those. There are one or two in some thank parts goodness. of the world, but, yes. but, but yeah, quite, thank goodness there aren't. Um, but this is part of the point. Of, Jesus seems actually to be sailing close to the wind in some ways, mm. in that by saying kingdom of God, he knows that this is a phrase with huge political resonances, mm -hmm. and yet he's going with that. Right. And I think that what we have done in the late Western world mm. is often to downgrade that and to say it was a quote-unquote purely spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly. very damaging as yeah. well. Um, so, yes, but Jesus is saying it's a political thing, but it's an upside-down political thing. It's, the, it, it's the, the, the reversal of all the power games that the world is playing, and yet it is the most powerful thing of all. Mm -hmm. And that you can see going on through Paul into the early church. And God chose what was weak mm -hmm. to shame the strong, mm -hmm. and that's very much a political statement. And I think we wrestle with this in our churches, that it is, of course, about God and a different sort of kingdom, but that different sort doesn't mean, therefore, it's a purely spiritual thing with no implications for this world. Mm -hmm. It means, therefore, the implications for this world are that we're not just joining in the ordinary power games, right. we're doing yeah. it differently. And so much more subtle today, living with a sympathetic, democratic exactly uh, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. political scene in which we try to say, now, are we, is, is that... Uh, 
struggle that Jesus had yes, against yes, those yes. oppressive powers of Herod yes, or yes. Caesar at a distance, yes. but was palatable. And, and, yet, we, and yet, you see, yeah. we think of our democracy as, as a much more user-friendly thing, and mm -hmm. so in many ways it is, and yet it horrifies me on both sides of the Atlantic to see, for instance, that in order to run for office, you have to be well endowed indeed, financially, indeed. you have to be That's this, right. that, and the other. That's right. Right. And there are things in our system which I think are more insidious because we don't notice them, and exactly. I, I sometimes wonder what Jesus would say about them. Mm -hmm. So that revolutionary idea idea isn't completely out of date. Sometimes I think we've spiritualized the kingdom mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it does seem more user friendly and instead mm -hmm. of being a small minority looking up and wishing that there was another mm -hmm. reign in mm -hmm. which we could participate, we are the majority, mm -hmm. at least in this country mm -hmm. still, mm -hmm. perhaps barely, mm -hmm. but still. And it makes a difference in how you evaluate yes. a revolutionary. It certainly does. And of course, your country began with a revolution against mm -hmm. my country. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and often using very deeply biblical language to sustain Indeed. that. Uh, and very ambiguous, a lot of that stuff was on mm -hmm. both sides of the Atlantic. So I mean, I think we've, we've, we've established, uh, really, we cannot simply spiritualize this. Indeed. Where do we go from Tom, there? could you yeah. touch upon the temple, uh, how significant that Jesus yes. ended up there in Jerusalem right. at the temple, and, right. and why not at the palace or the praetorium or some other Right, right. Place. Yeah, I think this is enormously important. We, we easily slip into thinking in the Western world that the temple was just like, you know, a great cathedral, which right. would just be on a street corner somewhere, and it'd be a nice building and a religious center, but not, not much more. Mm -hmm. But for a first century Jew, the temple quite literally was the center of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. You know, old medieval maps would have the world right. with Jerusalem in the middle, mm -hmm. and that represents actually something very profound of Jewish consciousness, mm -hmm. that the Jerusalem and the temple were at the middle of not just the globe, but of the cosmos, and the temple was the place where God had chosen to live. Mm -hmm. And so to come there was to come to the, the, the living, beating heart of everything mm -hmm. that mattered, and then yes. to do something like claiming authority over that is about as huge a claim as it was possible to make in that culture. Do you think that as Jesus uh, went about being prophetic, that he had a vision for including non-Jews in this kingdom of God in a way that was shocking mm. to... Yeah, I, th I think he did, but there's, I think there's two things to say about that. I, I think the most important thing to recognize is that in some of the Jewish prophetic writings, including some of the ones that Jesus plugged into, like Isaiah, Isaiah. for instance, mm -hmm. or as you say, Isaiah, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, th there is this theme that when God does for Israel what God is going to do for Israel, mm -hmm. then the rest of the world is going to get in on the act somehow as well. And, and that's, that's part of what it means to be a Jewish-style monotheist, to believe that God has chosen Israel for the sake of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, when Israel was being battered and beleaguered by the pagan nations, then it was easy for Jews in Jesus' day to say, well, when God does for Israel what he's going to do for Israel, then the world will get judged and smashed to smithereens mm -hmm. and condemned and all the rest of it. And Jesus is saying, God is now doing for Israel what he wanted to do for Israel. So, of course, pretty soon now, the nations are going to come in. Many will come from east and west and sit down mm -hmm. with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense that Jesus would have said that. However, it's interesting mm -hmm. that since the early church, from very early on, went rapidly out with Paul and so on to the Gentile world, mm -hmm. there are not many sayings like that in the gospel traditions, which look to me as mm -hmm. though the early church has not actually put those back on the lips of Jesus. These are hints and signs. Okay. But of course, in Paul himself, we find a clear recognition that Jesus confined his ministry, his own personal ministry, mm -hmm. to the Jewish people, and that he left the wider implications to be pursued by his followers. And how complex yeah. that must have been because yeah. there was yeah. no one norm of Judaism, as we know. Of course. And so the mm -hmm. audience not only reaching out to the Gentiles, but even what segment of the Judaisms of his yes, day. Yes, yes, that's right. And we have, of course, the high profile clashes with the Pharisees, which are very controversial in scholarship. But um, it seems to me when we realize the Pharisees' political agenda, we realize as well that whatever Jesus was saying, that was slicing mm -hmm. clean across their political. It's not just that they had some funny disagreements about abstract theology. This stuff meant something at street level. But we have no record of Jesus addressing, say, the Essenes. Mm -hmm. um, he may well have known some Essenes. His cousin John the Baptist may have had some direct contact with the Essenes, but we no record of that. So yes, it, we, we are piecing together this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but I, I think 
in my reading of, of the early Jewish writers like Josephus, the great historian, for instance, it seems quite clear that an awful lot of his contemporaries, whatever their particular nuances, were very, very keen on getting rid of the, the Romans, becoming free at last, on some kind of a new exodus, the waiting for God to do mm -hmm. again what God had done, mm -hmm. bringing Israel out of Egypt and so on. So there was this air of expectation. And whenever anyone raised a flag of revolution, there were plenty of people who'd say, yep, let's mm -hmm. do it. Mm. Did did all those people uh, seem to buy into smashing the Gentiles? I mean, that, that's pretty strong language. And uh, mm. it's it's difficult to say. My reading of it, as best I can, is that already in Jesus' day there was a kind of a hard line and a softer line. And to take the two schools of the Pharisees, insofar as we know about them, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. Um, who are teachers of the generation immediately before Jesus, it looks as though Hillel had been saying more, no, if you're a Jew, you study Torah, you, you live your life of prayer and obedience to God, etc. Um, but we'll let the rest of the world do its own thing and okay. we'll even say some prayers for them and so on. Whereas the school of Shammai would say, no, that's not yeah. good enough. We've got to be mm -hmm. hard line about this. We've got to be tough-minded. And, and as I read the evidence, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it was the school of Shammai that was in the ascendancy through the period okay. of Jesus and Paul, mm -hmm. and it was only after the destruction of the temple in mm -hmm. 70, and then after the failure of the great revolt uh, in the 130s, mm -hmm. um, a century after Jesus, that then the Hillelites mm -hmm. really came into their own. Um, so my guess is that the majority of people who are following the teaching at the time of Jesus were the more hardliners. Mm. Or at but least those around him yeah, in yeah, Jerusalem. Yeah, I think yes. so. And, in, and many in Galilee. Galilee mm -hmm. was a mm -hmm. hotbed of revolution, not perhaps as much as people have sometimes thought, but there was certainly a lot of revolutionary tendency there. It is interesting to think how the message of Jesus, and, and we'll leave the resurrection piece mm, for yeah, a minute, sure. did spread into uh, Jewish communities oh, yes, that yeah. received it happily outside of Jerusalem. Oh yes, that's certainly true. And indeed, one recent writer has argued very strongly that Jews for some centuries later went on being uh, the people who are most likely to convert to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's not the way we've always read it. But I think there is a good argument to, to, to make for that. Um, uh, and the book of Acts implies very strongly, states very strongly, that there were thousands of Jews who said, wow, this is it. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, obviously the resurrection had a lot to do with that, but the resurrection by itself in a vacuum couldn't have done that. It has mm -hmm. to be grounded yeah. in who Jesus was and what he was doing. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Tom, could you fill in somewhat of the context in this opening uh, conversation about Jesus as he was wandering the hills in, of Galilee? Was he a sentinel figure with his mm -hmm. 12 disciples and a few others, or was that something that was normal? Um, as we look back in the Bible and trying to understand who Jesus was, was as he was moves norm, to normal to have somebody wandering around with, um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, we do know that there were other prophetic figures, other messianic figures, other leader figures who were emerging and had done in the generation immediately before Jesus and would go on doing through mm -hmm. the 40s and 50s of the okay. first century up to the cataclysmic war in the 60s against mm -hmm. Rome. So I think, yes, it's quite reasonable to suppose that there were other figures. And those hills in Galilee, you know, we have that lovely <laughs> hymn, O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above. But actually mm -hmm. the hills were full of bandits, you know. Okay. They, they weren't calm at <laughs> all. Uh, and the Sabbath rest by Galilee was a political mm -hmm point that we've right. got to keep the Sabbath to keep those mm -hmm. pagans at bay, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we need to think back into that. So I think, yes, Jesus would have been in a sense a recognizable figure. Now, the choice of the 12, though, mm -hmm. we don't have evidence, I think, that other leaders chose 12 followers. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a very interesting one because notice Jesus t chose 12, not 11. He wasn't number one of the 12 okay. new tribes, mm -hmm. as it were. He was the one who called this 12 into existence. Very mm -hmm. interesting, symbolic. Indeed mm -hmm. it is. And that leads back to the question I was just thinking about. I mean, we've talked a little about kingdom of God, mm. but what constituted the kingdom of God that Jesus was interested in? Um, mm. Mm. Political, not just spiritual, but different, yeah. not exactly the same, still in line with prophecy, but yeah. 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 slightly yeah. an edge push that the yeah. Pharisees yeah. Would, would not... What, yes, what yes, would you like yes. to say about that? Well, yes, it, it's, it's very tricky, but it seems to me, looking at the evidence, that uh, one of the things we have to say is the only way Jesus seemed to be able to describe it is on the one hand to tell stories and on the other hand mm. to act symbolically. Now, yes, yes. both of those okay. are counterintuitive for us in the Western world. We want <laughs> fixed answers which we can put in a test tube and mm -hmm. sift out. <coughs> These stories and symbols, that's mm -hmm. where it's at. But what we can see in those stories mm -hmm. and symbols, I think, goes back into 
the prophetic scriptures, particularly I find the book of Isaiah again, and a passage which gradually as I was studying this became more and more important for me was Isaiah 52, where you get the herald on the mountain saying, your God reigns, which is mm -hmm. kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And there are three things going on in that passage. One is uh, that evil is going to be defeated at last, whether the evil empire of Babylon or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another is obviously the vindication of Israel in terms of this great new exodus or the great final return from exile or however you like to put it. And then the third thing, which I think we've often missed out, is that Israel's God himself, who they called at that time Yahweh, though by Jesus' day they didn't say mm -hmm. that name, um, that Yahweh is going to return personally to Zion. And so you've got a sense of evil being defeated, mm -hmm. you've got a sense of Israel being vindicated, and you've got the strong sense that God is coming back at last to reign as king. And how you put all that together, yeah. again, it takes stories and symbols to do it. And I think that Jesus was deliberately and dramatically telling those stories in new ways, always with himself in the middle of it. If I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, mm -hmm. the kingdom of God has come upon you. you know, the call of the Twelve is the renewal of Israel. And then I have argued elsewhere that his last great journey to Jerusalem was a deliberate acted symbol of God returning to Zion, that Jesus was, as it were, embodying that mm -hmm. promise. And of course, the Latin word for embodying <coughs> is incarnating. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that's how I put the yeah. package together anyway. Do you think that Jesus came seeking death? I, as you spoke earlier, yeah, I, yeah. I found myself wondering if he thought that it would require his death yeah. or if he was willing to follow that kingdom path yeah. Yeah. even though it would lead to death. I, I think it's a bit of both. Um, I'm aware, very much aware, that if you sort of talk about Jesus seeking death, it sounds mm -hmm. as though he's some kind of a kamikaze Indeed. pilot, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I mean, Socrates is, is an interesting model and people have often paralleled Jesus and Socrates. Mm -hmm. Socrates did not want to die but he remained true to the philosophical vision which he had had. Mm -hmm. And when they said, just step slightly this way and then we'll let you off, he mm -hmm. said, I can't possibly do that. There's a question of integrity <laughs> here. Yeah. And I think that is all there in Jesus and more so. However, mm -hmm. I think what you find in Jesus is that he is constantly, by these stories and symbols, evoking those Jewish traditions which, as I said, go back through the martyrs of uh, 200 years before his day, the Maccabees, Maccabees. Who, who did sure. all that. And the Maccabees themselves were plugged into the book of Daniel or mm -hmm. the traditions around that, which were about redemptive suffering in a sense or suffering and vindication. Mm -hmm. And the book of Daniel itself seems to be one of the earliest interpretations of the servant passages in Isaiah, mm. which speak of suffering not merely as something which you may have to go through, mm -hmm. but strangely something as a result of which God will redeem Israel and the world. Mm -hmm. And so I believe Jesus evoked those traditions. It wasn't that there was this sort of servant figure which he had on a peg and he pulled mm -hmm. down and said, right, I'm the servant, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's more that there is a, a matrix of traditions and he discovers his own, I mean, how do any of us know our vocation? That's mm -hmm. a very interesting mm -hmm. question. I think Jesus was aware of a vocation to go to the place where Israel and the world were in pain to take that on himself, believing that somehow, if he did that, this would be the means of the kingdom coming, of evil being defeated, and indeed of Yahweh returning to Zion. And I think in Jesus' own self-understanding, mm. the return of Yahweh to Zion climaxes on the cross. And that, I think, generates this explosion that we call New Testament theology. But I think it was there in a nutshell in the mind of Jesus. So there was no sense in Jesus, you, you think, that uh as he was on the cross, Yahweh's return to Zion had been forestalled yet again. Oh. Uh, it's interesting to look yeah. back to yeah. Isaiah and Daniel and the Maccabees. In each case, the kingdom yeah. did yeah. not come. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I know. I, it's very important to say, along with what I've just said, that Jesus did not go to the cross saying to himself, oh, well, that's okay because in yeah, a couple of days I'm going to be raised from the dead. Right. No, yeah. uh, that we find no trace of that in the Gospels at all. Indeed. Jesus in Gethsemane and then uh, on the cross itself. And I, I do not think the early church could have made this up. It's so against what you might expect. Jesus seems to have 
had a sense of darkness and abandonment mm -hmm. and failure. After mm -hmm. all, it yeah. was failed messiahs who end up yes. on crosses, not successful mm -hmm. messiahs. And Jesus must have known that this was the biggest gamble out. This, you know, um, uh, Einstein's question as to whether God plays dice is mm -hmm. right on the table here. Mm -hmm. This is a okay. gamble. This mm -hmm. is Jesus risking all, risking everything on the belief that maybe this was in fact the way to go and knowing that if he wasn't right, he was the craziest mm. blasphemer of his generation. And I really think that's where Jesus was as he went to the cross. And death would be the appropriate end. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, well, that, How exactly. How could you go back exactly. from that realization? Exactly. Yeah. And still yeah. is for us today. He's either the crazy man or... Exactly, yeah. right. I, I, think, I think that's right, that people still face that. And, and th this is the critical thing yeah. to realize, that Jesus, whatever you say about him, he can't just be a nice, cozy fellow to have right. on the side somewhere mm -hmm. to call on for some neat moral teaching or to look at as a great example. You know, Jesus cannot be that. He is either a dangerous blasphemer mm -hmm. or he really is uh, who the New Testament says he is. Mm -hmm. and. I say it like that because the New Test the church has not always got the New Testament right on this. Indeed, one of the things I would say in drawing this first session to a close is that uh, as we look at Jesus, I find continually that this is a great challenge to me as a, as, as a pastor and priest and teacher. Yeah. It's very difficult often to, uh, to put the package together because Jesus is not what we necessarily expect him. Mm -hmm. But I would say this, that as I have looked at Jesus, as I've studied him and tried to live with what he was actually doing in the first century, I don't find this makes him irrelevant to me as a 20th century Christian. On the contrary, I find that he challenges me to think and work out new ways of being Christian, of being his follower for the 20th and the 21st century. And of course, as we've said, without the resurrection, this would all be very different. But as we'll see in the second and subsequent uh, programs in this series, the resurrection is the thing that really then did make all the difference. So we come to the question, how did Christianity begin and why? Why particularly did it take the shape that it did? That's the question I think that we have to ask as historians as well as as Christians if we're trying to get a handle on the first century and how it worked and what it means for us today. And when we ask that question, we discover that as well as Jesus, there were lots of other messianic or vaguely messianic movements within a hundred years or so either side of Jesus, from the period of the people we call the Maccabees, right through to the great final revolution led by a man called Bar Kokhba, which means the son of the star, about a century after Jesus. And we can locate Jesus within the map of those movements and say, but his movement was a bit different. Why was it different? In particular, we can see that Christianity began as a messianic movement. Paul uses the word Christos, which means Messiah, for Jesus. And even if you think, as some people do, that that was on its way to becoming a proper name, that merely heightens the mm. problem. Why did they use that word for Jesus that already within 20 or 30 years was becoming a proper name when Jesus so obviously hadn't done what messiahs were supposed to do? After all, Jesus was uh, quite a different figure from the Maccabees, from Herod, from all the different messianic figures like Bar Kokhba himself. Mm. He wasn't leading a military movement and particularly hadn't done the two things that messiahs should do, which were particularly to defeat the enemy, in this case Rome, and to rebuild the temple. He'd significantly failed to do those. Mm -hmm. But why did they say he was the messiah? Now, if you take some of the other messianic figures, Bar Kokhba or one of the best known ones a generation after Jesus, Simon Bar Giora, who was the, the, the great king of the Jews supposedly at the time of the Jewish war and the Romans took him back to Rome and executed him there. Uh, if you imagine shortly after their deaths, somebody saying, I think Simon really was the Messiah. You know, the, the, the kindest reaction that a first century Jew would have, you know, you've obviously been out in the right. sun too long, yeah. you know, clearly he wasn't the Messiah. Mm -hmm. You may say that he was a righteous man and that God approved of him and that he is, uh, um, you know, one day he will rise again or whatever. Don't say he's the Messiah. And you see, when a messianic movement collapsed around the death of the founder, they had two options. They could either uh, abandon the movement altogether and, and thank the Lord that they got away with mm -hmm. their own lives, or they could get another Messiah. And we have evidence of some groups that did that. Find somebody else, preferably mm -hmm. within the same family. Now, 
here's mm -hmm. the conundrum. James, the brother of Jesus, was the great leader in Jerusalem through the whole of the first generation, right through until when he was murdered by uh, the chief priests, actually, um, shortly before the outbreak of the Jewish war in the 60s. And yet nobody ever said that James was the Messiah. He was known as the brother of the so-called mm -hmm. Messiah. We have to ask, as first century historians, why? It would have been very natural. They all said, no, Jesus was the Messiah. And if you ask why, they all say, because Jesus was raised from the dead. And that forces us as historians to say, what did they mean by that? Mm -hmm. And what do we say about them saying that? Now, you can run a similar argument with Kingdom of God, which we were talking about in the last session. Christianity began as a Kingdom of God movement. Already by the time of Paul, he doesn't say Kingdom of God that often, but when he does, it's clearly a shorthand slogan for what Christianity is all about. Kingdom of God, he says, doesn't mean food and drink, it means righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He just tosses it in as though we all know this is what we're about, we're Kingdom people. But when Jews spoke about the Kingdom of God, non-Christian Jews, they meant, as we saw, getting rid of the Romans and all that stuff, Israel becoming top nation in some shape or form, and that clearly hadn't happened. So why did they say that it had happened? You know, if you said, from that day to this, to a Jew, the Kingdom of God has arrived, I, I've had Jewish friends say to me, blindingly obvious the Kingdom of God hasn't arrived, <laughs> look out of your window, read the newspaper, and yet they said, in some significant sense that it had. And the answer they all gave to why did they say mm -hmm. that was not just, well, we were followers of Jesus and he was a great guy and we liked having meals with him and so on, mm -hmm. but that he rose again from the dead. And then you can do it, uh, the same argument at a third stage. Christianity began as a resurrection movement. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you look at the earliest writings we have in the New Testament, and that is Paul, of course, mm -hmm. Resurrection is not something bolted on at the edge as though we've got all this other theology mm -hmm. and then, by the way, there's also resurrection. Mm -hmm. If you try and take the resurrection strand mm -hmm. out of the arguments, they all just fall apart. Mm -hmm. Paul's talking about prayer, about baptism, about the Eucharist, about all sorts of things. Jesus' death and particularly resurrection are woven right in there. But, as we shall see a bit later, resurrection in first century Judaism uh, was... A, a, a doctrine about the return of Israel from its exile. If you go back to Ezekiel 37, where the idea really gets going, it's a metaphor for the return from exile. And that obviously hadn't happened in the sense that people wanted. And if you say, well, through the Maccabean writings, it had come to be actual prediction about martyrs getting their bodies back again, well, obviously that hadn't happened as well. Abraham, mm -hmm. Isaac, and Jacob, the martyrs, they, they weren't walking around again. So why did the early Christians say that the resurrection had occurred. You know, in Acts is a very interesting phrase where it says that they were preaching in Jesus the resurrection of the dead, that it had happened in some sense. And they all said, well, it really did happen, and it happened to Jesus. And then, finally, Christianity began not as a personality cult, but as a person cult. What do I mean by that? It isn't just that they so enjoyed being with Jesus. He was such a nice guy, you know. They just, they just That's right, they, yes. ju they just sort of loved mm -hmm. him. And so this wonderful personality. Undoubtedly, he did have an extraordinary personality, but the point is that Jesus was worshipped in early Christianity, not because he was a nice or good man, but because of who he was and what he'd done and what he'd achieved at a much deeper level. And if we say why, well, yes, his life before his resurrection is obviously important. Mm -hmm. But if you say, well, would there have ever been that sort of a cult, that sort of a new movement without the resurrection, the answer is obviously no. So as a historian of the first century, I think I am bound to ask, as well as as a practicing Christian I'm bound to ask, what precisely did they mean by resurrection? And what do we say about the great claims that they made. Mm -hmm. So that's where I start, yeah. and I'm intrigued yeah. to know where you folks come in on this, because I, I find these arguments very exciting, but uh, where are they going for you? Tom, I know you're going to talk more about the resurrection, but I'd like you yeah. to focus a little bit more on the Messiah, that title, mm -hmm. Messiah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one way I've understood yeah. it is that there were a lot of different ways of what Messiah meant. Uh, mm -hmm. An example today is if Jesus came and he said, I am an artist. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some folks would say, well, that means he's a painter or he's a, mm -hmm. a sculptor mm -hmm. or a singer. Mm -hmm. Certainly when uh, the church began to yes. give him that name, mm 
there were all kinds of understandings of, well, what kind of a messiah? Could yes, you talk yes, more yes. about that? To, to be sure, yes. Uh, th there is no one messianic expectation in Judaism. Mm -hmm. However, some of the most recent scholarship that I've read on this is very interesting in implying that there's a lot more messianic expectation bubbling along than some of our scholarship has allowed for. For okay. instance, when the Jews translated the Bible into Greek mm -hmm. two or three centuries before Jesus, it's now been shown that a lot of the uh, the ways they translated some of the rather cryptic passages in the Hebrew Bible mm -hmm. were such as to bring out a messianic mm -hmm. meaning, okay. whether or not w we are sure that it was there in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So it's clear there mm -hmm. was something of a groundswell and that uh, a Messiah, as I say, basically had to do these two things, to defeat the enemy mm -hmm. and to build the temple. It's very interesting. There was a, um, a Hasidic rabbi in New York a few years ago oh, yes. mm -hmm. who when, when he was in his uh, last days his followers were itching for him to declare mm -hmm. that he was the Messiah right. and then he died yeah. and some of them said he really is the Messiah and he'll come again and of course right. other Jews mm -hmm. said you're just getting this from Christianity right. but the interesting thing to me was that one of the key arguments that serious minded Jews used as to why he wasn't the Messiah was that he had not freed Israel from her enemies mm -hmm. and he had not rebuilt the temple mm -hmm. and those two go from David and Solomon defeating the Philistines and building the temple mm -hmm. through Hezekiah, Josiah, through all sorts of messianic figures, right down to Bar Kokhba who is fighting a war against Rome and who mints coins with the facade of the temple on to say, you know, that's mm. what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so that is a kind of a constant that runs through messianic speculation and then generates the Herodian movement, the Maccabean movement, the different individuals who do different things. Uh, they're all doing it their own way. It's as though there are certain big constants and Jesus is plugging into that and then doing it his own way. Because mm -hmm. did he defeat the enemy? Did he rebuild the temple? The Christians said, yes, but it wasn't the enemy you thought and it wasn't the temple you thought. You know, that's, that's where it's at. But there must have been a a complex way that Jesus would have understood his task because the temple was still standing yeah. when yeah. he was uh, active right, in right. Galilee and Jerusalem. So would it have been more a purification of the temple or reclaiming it for a, with a genuine priesthood? Right, right. yes, that, that's, that's a tricky one. But of course, already within Judaism uh, at the time of Jesus, we see at least two other ways of talking about the temple. The Pharisees, who are basically a lay movement mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. based more away from Jerusalem, I think, or at least active mm -hmm. more away from Jerusalem, they are saying with some of the Psalms that when you pray and fast and give alms in Galilee or in the Diaspora Judaism, that is as though you were in, in the, the temple. temple. Mm -hmm. When you mm -hmm. study the Torah, the law, it's as though you were in the temple. Mm -hmm. And the Essenes, likewise, are treating their community as the real temple, the sort mm -hmm. of the temple in waiting, mm -hmm. because they regard Herod's temple as uh, ineradicably corrupt. Um, so that there are models in Judaism for having counter temple movements or alternative ways of doing the mm -hmm. temple thing. And it looks to me as though Jesus was like that only a bit more so. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting that in the one of Paul's earliest letters, Galatians, he describes that the three big leaders in Jerusalem, Peter, James, and John, are known as the pillars, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. seems to imply that the very early community thought of itself like that as well as the true temple. Mm -hmm. Even though they went on worshiping mm -hmm. in the temple, mm -hmm. they knew that they were really a sort of secret counter-temple movement. And this seems to be one of the ways that new movements thought of themselves within Judaism. So it doesn't surprise me to find Jesus doing and saying things which imply if you like, that when he came to Jerusalem, the place wasn't big enough for him and mm -hmm. the temple, temple together. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so yeah. the rebuilding of the temple that Jesus speaks about mm. in the Gospels mm. has to do with the reconstitution of, of, of the whole community. The people. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think that Jesus does not envisage a bricks and mortar rebuilding. Mm -hmm. um, and I think his followers basically did not envisage that. And I think they're aware that they're living in this kind of odd, ambiguous mm -hmm. overlap yeah. period yeah. because the temple is still a holy place, you know. And well, when I today go to Jerusalem, uh, I, awesome. I, it, it is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, even though, as a Christian, I believe that Jesus is the true temple and that Jesus' people, mm -hmm. indwelt by the Spirit, are the true temple in some sense. I still find yeah. Jerusalem an awesome and evocative mm -hmm. place. Yeah. So I don't see why they shouldn't have done it. Right, right. 
Oh, and they did. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. That's Holy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, right. That's right. yeah amazing. <laughs> it, it reminds me also of Jesus, uh, Caesarea Philippi, uh, mm -hmm. and Mark, and when it seems like the disciples are beginning to yes. get a clue of who Jesus is. Right. And then he tells them mysteriously, and so many people ask me, why did Jesus tell them in a, in a sense, keep it to yourselves, don't tell anybody what yes. you've seen and heard yes. until you've seen the Son of Man rise yes. on yes. the third day? And they're yes. scratching their head, well, let's go public with this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. that's right, that's right. And, and I mean, that ties together the two things that, that, that are really talking about here, doesn't it? That on the one hand, Jesus going up to Jerusalem, what was that all about? And on the other hand, there is something that will only become clear at Jesus' resurrection. And they're puzzled because the idea of one person rising from the dead in the middle of history is yeah. not what they have in mind. The resurrection means Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the whole shebang. You mm -hmm. know, they're all going to rise together. And here he's saying the Son of Man will be raised. And I think they think that's a metaphor for something, and they don't know what it's a metaphor for. So they're very puzzled. And then the thing happens. L l let me just say, I mean, I find this fascinating. I don't know if you know the, the, the cult movie, The Italian Job, which ha came out 20 years mm -hmm. ago or so, no. which ends with a literal cliffhanger mm. wi with a, 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 a bus with the ah. loot that they've stolen at the back end okay. and the people at the front end, and mm -hmm. it's hanging on a cliff. And the movie ends with them just doing this, and we want to know what happens next. It, and it, what's happened is they've taken the metaphor mm -hmm. and made it literal. Now, what happens with the resurrection is that uh, it seems that the resurrection started out life as a metaphor for the restoration of Israel, okay. and then, lo and behold, it happened. The metaphor became literal, and, uh, and they weren't expecting that. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. much a Mark in that movie reminds me of the end of Mark, where right. it's before right. they were afraid, and it really places into the lap of mm -hmm. whoever's mm -hmm. reading. Well, what would you do if you saw that and uh, inclined to? Yes, yeah. yes. I actually, I have my own take on Mark. I, sus sure. I suspect yeah. that um, that there really was an ending, which that is now lost. lost. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. a beginning as well. Uh, exactly, yes. exactly. Yes. But, but that's what happened to scrolls. scrolls. Look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. The beginning and then drop off. Yeah. I'm thinking about that Messiah, um, wondering if another way that we could say the task of the Messiah is uh, to somehow usher in the time or or announce the time without ushering it two mm -hmm. very different sensibilities mm -hmm. uh, when God will finally keep that covenant mm -hmm. of, of promised blessing mm -hmm. one of the places that I look at the work of the Messiah with my students that we all find fruitful is in the canticles in Luke's gospel yes. mm -hmm. and when Zechariah mm -hmm really expresses the longing of the people mm. that finally God will remember us and we will and there is a, there is a joyful uh, quality in his understanding the role of yes. human beings be able mm -hmm. to worship and serve God yes. without yes. fear without fear mm -hmm. absolutely and there, it absolutely. is political yeah. yes. but it is also devoted to God with yes. a freedom that yes, uh, yes. And, and I mean I think that's that's a very helpful way to get in because you see it in one of the books of the Maccabees first Maccabees where it suddenly goes into this lyrical description that after the Maccabees had cleansed the temple and established the new regime, you mm -hmm. see, and driven away the Syrians, then all Israel sat under their vines and their fig trees and there mm -hmm. was no one yes. to make them afraid, which is a way of saying this was the fulfillment of prophecy. And of course, within a very short time, most of the people in Israel were saying, actually, we don't like this new regime. Right. This can't have been the fulfillment after all. But then when you look at the New Testament, you find, uh, and you know, the real antithesis mm -hmm. of joy is not sort of, uh, of, of fear, is not tranquility, but joy. Yes. And, and you find this note of joy mm -hmm. that they are not afraid, yeah, even though they're being put in prison. The circumstances mm -hmm. haven't right. changed. Th th that's mm -hmm. right. So. And so, uh, and, and I find right. myself saying, and, and I remember this was a wonderful moment for me uh, at a point in my scholarship where I'd been studying precisely that context of expectation in Judaism, mm -hmm. and then studying in parallel the early church and its worldview and how it worked. And instead of that longing for something, there was celebration yeah. at the same yeah. point in the worldview. You know, there was, a, and you have to say, why? Granted, they were being beaten up and stoned mm -hmm. and cut in two and so on. The an and the answer they give, Jesus was raised from the dead. Mm. And so we have to say, you know, what was that all about? Tom, one of the things I love about the book of Acts is how. Uh, how closely tied it is to us in that once Jesus has ascended, mm. people have to work these things out without being able to check things out yes. with Jesus. Yes. But it is fascinating to me to think about 
uh, that joy yeah, yeah, that yeah. people experience at the end of Luke's gospel. And then mm. they're back into wondering, again, very quickly yes. in the book of Acts, yeah. well now, is this the time that yes. you'll restore yes. it? Mm -hmm. And it, it <coughs> almost seems to mark uh, a way that humans have to yes. think about things. And it surely is a constant question for right. us. Right. Is now the time? Yeah. Yes. Is now the time? How yes. will we know? How long do we believe this if mm. the time never seems to be? Do we mm. turn into the people who are finally disengaged mm. from the Maccabees mm. or Bar Kokhba? Mm. And it has been so different with yeah. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right, and it raises the very important question which people have wrestled with in the churches and in scholarship. The, the, the question of, did Jesus think the world was going to end? Or, mm -hmm. um, and if so, so what? And was he wrong? And all of that. My own take on that is that actually we have misunderstood the language there, that the language he used, which we loosely call apocalyptic, about the sun and the moon being darkened mm -hmm. and so on, was language that they would have understood easily as language which was about actual space-time events, but which gave you the God dimension of those events, mm -hmm. if you like, mm -hmm. so that it wasn't about the world coming to an end, but was about decisive, climactic, what we would call earth-shattering events mm -hmm. within history. And I don't find, as I read the second and third mm -hmm. generation Christians, them being terribly worried because the end hasn't happened. There are little hints of it in mm -hmm. Second Peter and elsewhere, mm -hmm. but basically they're getting on with the job, they're yeah. expecting that one day God will wind it all up, but it's not a big deal that it hasn't happened in a generation. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the whole question of uh, where this movement was going and why, I think, hinges much more not on them thinking that they are living in the last days awaiting the end, but mm -hmm. they believe they're living in the first days mm -hmm. and yeah. the first days of God's new world. Right. That's what the resurrection narrative seems to be all about. We'll get onto that a, 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 a little bit later. Mm. Tom, I'm curious, the, the resurrection was so important for the church, the, the linchpin, and mm -hmm. the four mm -hmm. Gospels that we have in the canon, uh, why not more material given over to the resurrection, the appearances, so much material mm -hmm. is given over to the mm -hmm. teachings mm -hmm. and the healings, and then mm -hmm. the long passion narrative, mm -hmm. and then it sort of winds up and it's done. Yes, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I do think, as I yeah. said before, that Mark's Gospel actually did lose its ending, and mm -hmm. you can't prove that, but that's my best guess. Um, and, of course, Luke has this wonderful Emmaus Road story, yes. which oh, dominates, uh -huh. um, and then little bits either side. And it's really John who gives us most. But mm -hmm. even so, you're right. Um, I, we will, of course, come back to this later. But I think um, the, the, the early church was aware that the initial resurrection experiences were really few and far between. You know, it, this did not go on for a year or two or mm -hmm. three. This was mm -hmm. very brief mm -hmm. and fleeting. And I don't think they went on making up more stories about mm. it because I think they were determined to tell this very, very strange story um, as, as it was. I mean, and this, mm -hmm. my read of this relates to something you were saying a moment ago, um, that we tend to assume in our rather rationalistic world that once people have understood a point, mm -hmm. they will never raise that question again. <laughs> right. and, and that once a church has decided an issue, that will never be mm -hmm. raised again. I wonder, which world do people think like, uh, who think yeah. like that live yeah. in, you know? Um, in human life and in church life, we are constantly, you know, people say uh, that, that, that if Jesus had given clear teaching about the food laws, Paul wouldn't have needed to write Galatians. Well, give me a break. You know, mm. Jesus is talking to puzzled disciples who are trying to make sense of this. Mm -hmm. And then the early church is in a quite different situation, and they're aware Jesus may have said this and that, but they're wrestling with situations on the yes. ground. And so, I mean, I think the resurrection does precipitate them into this new situation. And at one level, they've got this sense of it's happened. Mm -hmm. There is news to tell. Yeah. But in another sense, there's a new world out there. There are no maps. Nobody's been this way before. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And going into a world which uh, is very non-Jewish, you yeah. may not understand all those words and it's Greek Gentile. Yeah, yeah, and that's oh. what you find, of course, with Paul in Acts when he gets to Athens yeah. and that's he talks right. about Jesus and resurrection, which mm -hmm. in Greek is Jesus kyanastasis, and it sounds like a male and female pair of deities. Yeah. And they're used to people coming and telling him yeah. about it. And so Paul has to sort <laughs> of unscram... Can you imagine <laughs> Paul unscrambling that, thinking, oh, my goodness, we're back to square it's one. It's not a concubine yeah. he's talking that, about. That, right. That's right, yeah. exactly. And even <laughs> if people had some awareness in Athens of the concept of apotheosis, of... Yes. Mm -hmm. An emperor somehow yeah. being raised into yes. a, a yes. godlike state. That wasn't 
at all what Paul was talking about. And, it, yeah, that's right. And it was also laughable for yes. people who were sensible yes. back then. So yes, yes. So I mean, I think the question from all of that does yeah. does press for us that uh, because people have sometimes tried to explain the resurrection mm -hmm. by saying, oh, they believe that Jesus is now God, therefore they said he'd been raised from the dead. But actually, those two just, it doesn't work it like doesn't that. Work like if that. you say, supposing early Christians came to believe that Jesus was divine, they would just say, well, Jesus is divine, fine. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have said he'd been raised from the dead. And, you know, I go back to, to, to the Maccabees, the people who wrote about Judas Maccabeus, or more particularly about the martyrs who died in the struggle under mm -hmm. the Syrians in, in, in the 160s before Jesus, um, they said these martyrs, they are now with God, they are in a place of honor, mm -hmm. their souls are alive in, in God's presence. They didn't say they'd been raised from the dead. So mm -hmm. the question forces itself back on us. You know, there were options, there were ways that they could have talked. Why did they say this? We'll be getting to that. To that uh, it's yeah. interesting, right within the Gospels, there's a place where a distinction is made at uh, the Transfiguration, it yes. seems to me. Yes. Um, Moses and Elijah are there, yes. and they're recognizable even by people yes. who certainly yes. post-dated them by oh, many, many right, hundreds right. of years, yes. but they're not resurrected. They don't eat yeah. fish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's absolutely right. I, I would like to know how they knew it was Moses oh, and Elijah. Oh, students you know. always <laughs> ask that question. <laughs> I mean, because right. they didn't have sort of photographic record no. of what these guys looked like. No, of course, it's in the church hall. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's intriguing. Yeah. It's, it seems when you're talking about Paul in Athens and trying to unscramble that, it reminds me of today and how difficult it is to talk about the resurrection for yes. today. I know we'll yes. be getting Thank to you. that, but uh, with angels, uh, everybody has uh. their guardian angels and the lapel yes. pins and whatnot. Yes. And, and trying to make Jesus somewhat distinct, very yes, distinct yes. from, well, there's just a divine presence around here watching over yes. me. It's very odd. I have observed within my lifetime a shift from uh, angels being sort of flaky stuff that nobody ever bothered with, yeah. e except very way out people, to angels being now front and center in every mm -hmm. bookstore and calendars and goodness yeah. knows what, and yes, discover your own personal right. angel. And uh, uh, I, I think Interestingly, we are there reconstructing by accident mm -hmm. something of the speculative world of Jesus' own day, mm -hmm. where there were lots of Jews who were heavily into angels. And so, again, that was another option that they had. They could have said, Jesus is now an angel, and they mm -hmm. specifically That's didn't. Right. You know, yeah. So that uh, from all these angles, that the Christianity was a messianic movement, Christianity was a kingdom of God movement, Christianity was a resurrection movement. It wasn't an angel movement. It wasn't a personality cult. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all sorts of things that it might have been. It wasn't a, 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 a remembering a dead hero. Mm -hmm. So you know, for us, this is really the key question that we have to address. And in the subsequent videos, we're going to be putting together the bits of this jigsaw step by step. Granted that something dramatic happened what was it that precipitated this? It's been fascinating to me as a historian to see that when people have said, well, we know it can't actually have been resurrection, mm. to see what they scramble around to put mm -hmm. in its place. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we are therefore bound to ask, as we're going to do in the next video, what did first century Jews mean by the resurrection? Where were they coming from? How did they use this language? How did they think about life after death in general and about what God was going to do for Israel in particular? So those are the questions that as historians we have to ask, but this is by no means merely a dry historical inquiry. It remains of enormous vital importance for us as Christians today. When we use the word resurrection in our culture, both in Britain and North America, I think one of the biggest problems we face right off the top is that all sorts of people mean different things by it. For instance, I was taking part in a radio phone-in program a few years ago where somebody phoned in and talking about Jesus' resurrection, he said, well, I hope to go to heaven when I die and I'm not taking my body with me, <laughs> so I don't see why Jesus' body needed to be taken with him. And I thought, where do you start to explain to this person that Jesus rose from the dead is not the same as saying Jesus went to heaven when he died. And uh, resurrection is a quite different sort of thing in involving, for the early Christians, something that actually happened to Jesus involving his body and not 
simply uh, a generalized hope for what happens after death. However, many people have come to the whole question assuming that the resurrection really teaches us about what's going to happen to us uh, eventually. And though that is true at one level, it's not true in the way that many, including many Christians, think. So in this session, we're going to take a step back in time to the world that Jesus himself and Paul himself and all the early Christians lived in. That is the world of first century Jews. This is, if you like, uh, an exercise in discovering the meaning of one particular word and concept. Yeah. What did they mean when they talked about resurrection? Now, some scholars sometimes suggest that in the non-Jewish world, people believed in some kind of resurrection because they had visions or apparitions or ghosts or whatever. And uh, there have been some books written which make out that people were always popping back from the dead to say hello or to communicate some vision <laughs> or whatever. And actually, I think that has been grossly overstated. And, and what's more in particular, when they were talking about such ghosts or apparitions or whatever, they weren't talking about what Jews meant when they used this word or the idea of resurrection. What then did Jews believe about resurrection? What did they believe, for that matter, about life after death in general? Again, it used to be said, and, and some people watching this may have heard this in previous years or whatever, mm -hmm. that Jews believed in resurrection while Greeks believed in immortality mm -hmm. as a sort of disembodied thing. Mm -hmm. That's far mm -hmm. too simplistic. There was a range of beliefs in Judaism about what happened to people after they died. For one thing, we know that the Sadducees, who were the ruling elite, a rather small group, mostly based in Jerusalem, as far as we can tell, didn't believe in any sort of life after death at all, not just not resurrection, but they didn't seem to believe in any sort of survival, which is odd because in most cultures, ruling elites tend to take care ah, that they yeah, will do yeah, things which will point. mean that they'll still be the ruling elites right. afterwards. And it seems as though the reason that they held this at arm's length was that the idea of resurrection that the Pharisees believed in was a revolutionary idea. People who believe that God is going to make a whole new world and that they're going to be part of it tend to sit loose to what happens to them if they struggle right to mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. that new world right now. So resur resurrection was not just about God making new bodies for us in a new world, though it was about that. It was also about God remaking the way things are yes. in a way which present mm -hmm. rulers would find rather threatening yes. and, and rightly so. However, in between the Sadducees on the one hand, who didn't believe in any life after death, and the Pharisees, who clearly did believe in a bodily resurrection, you've got uh, quite a few Jews who seem to have believed that after death people, or at least the righteous people, did go to a disembodied bliss, which would then be a permanent state of disembodied bliss, not simply a transitional mode between present life disembodied state and then a resurrection. And you can tell that the Pharisees in particular were thinking about bodily resurrection precisely because they had to develop theories about an intermediate mm -hmm. state, what happened in between. You know, I've had sometimes people ask me at funerals of somebody that they've mm -hmm. been deeply close to. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to know is, one lady said to me, where is he now? She said, I right. believe yes. in the resurrection. Yes. What's going on now? And Jews and Christians have always struggled to find appropriate mm -hmm. language yeah. for that. And that's an important question, which I think we shall come back to later on. So uh, the important thing to, to get straight, and this is right off the top, is that when first century Jews in Jesus' world used the word or the idea of resurrection, it wasn't a general word for life after death, mm -hmm. it was a very specific word for what you might call a re-embodiment, uh, God giving people a new body. And if a martyr in the Maccabean period, say, was being torn apart on the rack or tortured to death or whatever, one of the things that they are reported to have said, and whether or not they actually said them doesn't matter, what matters is this is how people told the story later, mm -hmm. Uh, they reported to have said things like, you can take my entrails and guts, you can cut out my tongue or cut off my hands, because God is going to give them all back to me again. Mm. And, and so they really were talking about re-embodiment. Mm -hmm. But then when we then say, well, what did they mean by this resurrection thing itself? As we said last time, it goes back to passages like Ezekiel 37, <laughs> Uh, the Valley of the Dry Bones. It goes back to passages like Isaiah 25 and 26, 
which, uh, again, it's a rather difficult passage to interpret, but it's a very important one. And then particularly to Daniel chapter 12, the last mm. chapter of the book of Daniel. Yes. And we know from later Jewish writings that when Jews were talking about resurrection in both Jesus' day and subsequently, was Daniel 12 they went to again and again. Uh, and it would be worth folk taking time to, to study that chapter because there we find this idea of the righteous shining like stars and so on um, and, and that they will come back to life, the, the righteous, and God is going to make the whole place over again. And the point about all this is that for them bodily resurrection wasn't just about what God is going to do for me, you know, me and my That's life right. after death. Mm -hmm. We often have a rather self-centered view, yeah. I think, of life after death. This was the sharp edge of what God was going to do for the nation of Israel as a whole, mm -hmm. for the whole people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, they were all going to come back again the, into the new world that God was going to make. And the rabbis, the, the later Jewish successors of the Pharisees, even debated the precise manner in which God would mm. remake these bodies. It's a very interesting yeah. passage. Mm. Would God start with the bones and work out from there, mm -hmm. or would he start with something like a soul and gradually firm it up so that the bones would be the last bit? And whatever you say about that debate, the fact that they could have that discussion yes. proves yeah. the point that they were expecting physical beings to result at the end of it. So this is the map of belief upon which we must plot the rise of early Christianity and its whole character as a resurrection movement. It, it, it isn't just like those pagans who believed in apparitions or in occasional sort of contact through a medium with people who died or whatever. It's not like that at all. It belongs with the deeply Jewish belief that there is one God who is the creator and wants to reaffirm the goodness of this world. Mm. That's one of the things mm -hmm. I think the early Christians really grasped about that. But then when we look at that Jewish map and what they believed, we discover this very shocking thing that the early Christians said, it's happened already, that Jesus has actually been raised from the dead. And the stories in the Gospels of Jesus meeting people after he'd been raised from the dead don't conform to any of the patterns of the Jewish mm. stories about what they were talking about. So again, we're going to have to look at the question from the evidence of early Christianity and say, what did they think they were talking about? But, but for now, I think we, we should really concentrate on this Jewish meaning, this Jewish world of meaning, and to try to invite people to come with us back into that world and explore mm. what they were thinking about and how it all panned out. So, Tom, one thing that strikes me is that what you're suggesting about the Jewish understanding had a corporate, a, a collective, mm. uh, the mm. nation, the people. Mm. And as you also mentioned, that we tend to have an individualistic, mm -hmm. our dearly beloved will ascend right. into heaven. Ah, but ah. there is this Jewish sense that there's going to be a, a unification of all the beloved. I mean, we have yes, that, yes. Uh, the, the great cloud of witnesses. Yes, yes. But we've lost that somehow. And we yes. sort of beam me up, Scotty, to, yep. to yep. our dearly beloved. And That's right. in another world, but it's really the Jew Jewish sense of a, of a new family. And, and it's. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I think. I mean, we wrestle with this because I find the phrase in heaven or when we get to heaven mm -hmm. occurs so readily to people mm -hmm. that even if you struggle to say to folk that mm. the Bible doesn't talk <coughs> primarily about going to heaven when you die, but talks about God making new heavens and new earth and a re-embodiment within that new heaven and new earth, people will still say, oh, yes, I see. But then in the next breath, they'll <laughs> say, and you know, oh, will, yes. there, will there be shops in heaven? Or something? Right. <laughs> and you think, what are we talking about? Heaven. It's, it's a new world that God is going to make. Uh -huh. yeah. New uh -huh. creation. Although yeah. it, people may be forgiven for some of that confusion when you yes. think about saying the Lord's Prayer over and over again, uh -huh. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It sounds as if there is already some place where everything's just wonderful. Yes. And yes. then even Jesus talks a, a little bit about um, don't worry about the body that uh, oh, they can oh, destroy, oh. but uh, protect the soul. Yes, and yes. so folk, I think, find it very hard to yes. navigate that ancient yes. language. It's see. very interesting because that phrase in the Lord's Prayer, which is exactly belongs on this first century Jewish map, mm -hmm. um, of course, means more or less the opposite, of, the opposite. How, of how people mm -hmm. hear yes, it. I think so um, too. Because if people think of in heaven, they think 
the eventual state that we'll all end up in in a blissful, often mm -hmm. disembodied state. And so please, they think the prayer means, please may we have a little bit of um, God's will being done on earth because eventually it will be like that. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that at all. It's praying the life of, the present life of heaven down onto this earth. And the earth matters not because it's a temporary, rather shabby, second-rate thing, but it's the place that God made that God wants to see sorted out and mm -hmm. God's want, God wants justice and holiness and peace to, to live here. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the great things about the book of Revelation, which people often find very difficult to understand, is that at the end, it isn't the case that uh, the church gets snatched up away from earth to live in heaven, right, yes. but that the church comes down, the true people of God, to live on this earth, in the new heavens and new earth. It's a downward movement, not an upward one. It is, and it uh, fulfills what you had been talking about earlier when the city of Jerusalem finally is restored in uh -huh. some shining way, although without a temple, yes, which yes. is uh, a very Th interesting that's, that's right, and the whole temple and resurrection thing is very interesting because the Jews, when they were talking about that future world that God was going to make, they always talked about the temple in the middle of it, like the book of Ezekiel has, you see, yes, after the Valley yes. of dry, dry Bones, this huge vision of the new temple. And yet, in John's Gospel, when Jesus, as a first century Jew, is talking about the temple and says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it again, and they say, what do you mean build it again? It's taken years mm -hmm. to build. How are you going to do that? And John says he was talking about the temple of his body. So you see the Jewish idea of the destroying and rebuilding of the temple is now being translated by the early Christians into, this is really a metaphor for Jesus' death and resurrection, and then of course ultimately our death mm -hmm. and resurrection. Mm -hmm. Tom, tie in the, the understanding of kingdom of God again okay. to the resurrection, yes. because as Jesus emerges wet from the waters of the Jordan to begin yes. his yes. ministry, the first words from his mouth is, repent, yes. behold the kingdom, kingdom of God yes. is here, and yes. he signals this is where I'm going. Yes, and yes. everybody's trying to understand it, and then with the resurrection, we get yes. Yes. some understanding. But for us today to understand the resurrection, I think, is back through the kingdom of God, right. helping right. us understand. Yes, you know. yes, I, that, that's enormously important. I, I think what we have to realize is that there were several words and phrases which could function as slogans for something because they were kind of a key part of the whole. You know, we, when we talk about Christianity, yeah. We use the word Christianity, mm -hmm. we use the word the faith, we use the word mm. the gospel, we use the kingdom of God. And if push comes to shove, we could probably show that those are all related to one another and mm. that together they add up to Christianity. Yeah. But um, we use one element to refer to the whole. And in the same way, they could talk about in the new creation, or Jesus has the word in Greek, which is difficult to translate, in the palingonasia, which really means in the new birth, mm -hmm. okay. not an individual new birth, but in mm -hmm. the time when God brings everything to new birth. And so they can use these things as ways in to talking about the thing God's going to do for us. Mm -hmm. And that involves many different elements, but more specifically, if God is going to be king in this new way, the key point is that God has to defeat all the things which are defacing and distorting and destroying the good and lovely and beautiful world, and particularly yeah. the human lives in which God ought to be reflected because they're mm -hmm. image-bearing. They're supposed to be reflecting God's image. What are the things that ultimately destroy and distort and deface human lives and God's world? the answer must be decay and corruption and death and all that cause those things, including idolatry and immorality, etc. And so resurrection is the gift of God of the new world, which is the sign that God really is ruling the world in the way that he always intended. So kingdom of God entails resurrection yeah. because when God is truly king, <coughs> death itself will be defeated. And that's how I think they're mm. tied closely together. And it reminds me of the Sadducee bumper sticker that I see all around that we're preaching to. He who dies with the most toys wins. Oh. As if this is it and there's nothing yes, beyond yes. that. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. It's a Sadducee yeah. bumper sticker. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. And I think often even Christians, alas, in our culture 
get sucked down into this idea that, mm -hmm. oh yeah, we believe that there will be a future life, but, but let's have a good time here as well. So mm -hmm. it's not, uh, you know, we have, we have the best of both worlds in some ways in Western culture. Instead of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, we often say eat, drink, and merry, be merry because we're going to heaven. Because tomorrow know? we'll yeah. be in um, heaven. Yeah. Right. And, and it's interesting if we go back to some of our yeah. spiritual forebears, certainly where I live, which is in the northeast of England, where the, um, uh, some of the Celtic saints mm -hmm. were, people like Aidan and Cuthbert, they were amazingly mm. world affirming. They mm -hmm. believed in the goodness of the created order and the yeah. birds and the trees and so on. And they mm -hmm. were teaching the pagans around them to value the world as God's world, while at the same time, knowing that they needed to be holy and they were very ascetic in mm -hmm. their practices and their, their sort of fastings and prayings and so on. Um, because they believed God was going to remake the world, they were valuing this one, but not in a hedonistic sense. Mm -hmm. And that's a model which today's Christians find it very difficult to get hold of. It would be wonderful to be able to say, eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow we will die. <laughs> right. I, yeah. It really would. And, and in a way, <laughs> I think Christianity would encourage us not to... Uh, imagine only by not eating, not drinking, yeah, and yeah. being gloomy, yeah. Yeah. were we going to find some right. realization. Right, but it's, it's interesting that, that the Pharisaic belief in resurrection went with the sense that the present world is not at the moment all it should be, and so they have the rhythm, the symbolic mm -hmm. rhythm of feasting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. fasting. Mm -hmm. And I think Christianity at its best mm -hmm shares the same rhythm of feasting and fasting, which is both affirming that the world is mm -hmm. God's world, and let's not be mealy-mouthed about it. If we're going to have a party, let's have a really good party. You know, let's do it properly. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, there are times and seasons when it's appropriate to say, you know, this world is not as God wants it to be, and as a sign of that, we must fast and mourn and pray. Um, and that rhythm seems to be the appropriate way to live. And of course, as Christians, the greatest feast of all is the resurrection mm -hmm. feast, the Easter yeah. feast, yeah. not Christmas, incidentally. I mean, in our culture, oh. we've, mm -hmm. we've exalted Christmas and, and downgraded Easter, rather. Yeah. But for the early church, uh, you know, we don't know that they did anything about Christmas mm -hmm. to begin with, but Easter was the big one. And so that we live as feasting people yeah. who yeah. sometimes fast because we know that there is still more to come. And that balance, again, is so important to yeah. keep. Mm. I wonder if there's a disconnect also between our, our culture now and the first century because to talk about resurrection, it means death. And that uh -huh. still terrifies uh -huh. us so uh -huh. much. So if we can paper over uh, yes. this, the resurrection, then yes. we don't have to talk about what happened before, crucifixion. Yes, yes, yes. And, and I'm wondering in the first century, was there that, that same desire? Um, or, mm. you know, the, the resurrection is good news because we're going to die. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I think in our culture, and I see this in the way we do funerals and so mm -hmm. on, um, we say our culture, there are parts of sure. culture which still do funerals rather well. In Irish culture, for instance, they still know yeah. how to do a proper yeah. wake and all the rest of it. But certainly in most of England at the moment, and I suspect many parts of America, death is sort of screened off. Oh, yes. We try to oh. pretend it doesn't really yeah. happen. And you notice that then when Christians do Holy Week and Easter, even good devout practicing Christians often will quietly ignore Good Friday. They, they just take a day off and do something, you know, weed the garden or whatever. And then they'll come to church on Easter Day. Then they wonder why Easter isn't as exciting as it should be. Okay. Is you only get Easter if you've actually agonized through Good Friday. But of course, previous generations, I think it's a very modern thing, previous generations lived with death as a fact of life, if mm -hmm. I can put it slightly true. Irishly. Um, th th that, uh, they, they, it was it was up front. They saw people die, people they knew died all the time. It, it's in our generation where, with modern medicine and so on, many people really can avoid death for much of the time. Then suddenly yeah. it happens, and it's a huge shock. Yeah. And so, they, because they can't take the shock, they they push it away. They screen, and that's deeply unhealthy psychologically as well as theologically. So I think first century Jews, the world uh, that, that Jesus lived in, death and often horrible death yeah. was every day. Mm -hmm. It was a huge thing. And for a Jew who believed that humans were made in God's image and that human life was a God-given wonderful... You see, if mm -hmm. you were a Greek, a Platonist, you would say, well, being human, being physical is a very dumb thing anyway, mm -hmm. you know, a very odd, bizarre thing. Very we, inefficient. That's thing right, that's sure. right. And, and we really should be escaping from this mortal body right. into the pure life of the soul. So that was their way of coping with death. But mm -hmm. for a Jew who believed that this life was good and God-given, mm -hmm. 
it's not only awful and horrid to have somebody you love die, it's a theological affront, and then you feel the promise of resurrection oh, coming yeah. through the middle. Yeah. Yeah. I, as you speak, I, uh, I imagine that for some Christians, Easter is less exciting, um, not only because we don't go through Good Friday and, and we're not good mm -hmm. at that at all, mm -hmm. but also because there have been so many Easter's between mm -hmm. now and the oh, time of Jesus, oh, yeah. and we know that there has yeah, not been yeah. a general resurrection. And then, yeah. as you continued, it occurred to me that thinking about death as a theological affront for those in covenant relationship with God, the Holocaust, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. becomes something mm -hmm. that Christians and yeah. Jews need to talk right, about right. in terms of promise of resurrection. Right. In ways that I think we almost don't know how. Yes, yes. That's absolutely right. And I mean, one of the most moving things to come out of the Holocaust is a very famous thing, is uh, a story from one camp where a child was being hanged. Mm. And I think it's Elie Wiesel who right. tells the story. And somebody shouts, where is God? Where is God? And somebody mm -hmm. else says, there he is. And this sense of God being present in the suffering, mm -hmm. God suffering with the people, is a huge insight which then I think Jews and Christians really can share. Mm -hmm. And I think there were some first century Jews, maybe not many, I think there were some first century Jews who might have been mm. prepared to say a little bit of that, although the majority, as far as we know, were wanting to say that maybe God is with us in a sense in our suffering, but the only reason for that is that we will then be triumphant pretty soon and we mm -hmm. will then be mm -hmm. um, back, back on top where we yeah. belong. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree. I mean, I think as Christians, looking back to those first century Jewish roots, we find ourselves now today in dialogue with Jews who themselves are looking back to those mm -hmm. roots and who are themselves debating about what resurrection means. And it's interesting that in contemporary Judaism that you find similar debates between the Orthodox who still say there will be a bodily resurrection and the liberal Jews who say this is just a metaphor for mm -hmm. our making the world a better place mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting that in Christianity we, are, we, f we feel the backwash of those debates rather. Tom, I'm wondering if there is a uh, sense about the topic of this section, um, talking about the first century Jewish understanding of, of the resurrection, if there was a sense of the fullness of time, that if yes. Jesus hypothetically appeared 500 years prior with yes. the rebuilding of the temple, yes. Yes. would there have been the same understanding or yearning for resurrection? Yes. It's, yes. It seems once again there was so many pieces that had fallen into place where people right. said, aha, Right. And Jesus right. addressed right. that. Right, right. That's uh, you're absolutely right, and I think that is a very important part of the first century scenario. That you know we live at a time with apocalyptic speculation, and here we are coming into a new millennium. What's going on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's all sorts of nonsense talked about that, as well as some sensible things. I hope. But um, the first century Jews were living at even more, in a sense, of a time of crisis because, and uh, the historian Josephus tells us this. Um, that there was a text in their scriptures, and I think he was talking about the book of Daniel, which meant uh, that at that time mm. a world ruler would arise from Judea. Mm. And if we put the book of Daniel together in chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 9 mm -hmm. particularly, mm -hmm. we can see there's a chronological scheme, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. calculating, they're, they're doing sums, mm -hmm. and it works because Daniel says that the exile will last for 70 weeks of years, yes. that's 70 times 7 years. So they're saying when precisely, is that the beginning of the exile or the end, or mm -hmm. when is it from? Mm -hmm. And and so y you get then, of course, when the Romans take over around the time that Jesus is born and Judea becomes a Roman province, some people are calculating maybe it's 70 years from then, yeah. which is why you have the Jewish revolt in the 60s, because mm -hmm. they think it's going to happen then. Mm -hmm. And so they, they are they are all, well not all, many of them are speculating about when is it that God is going to do this great thing. So that uh, there is a sense that Jesus is coming in on the tide. Now you could mm. say, well there you are, the movement just happened because some people wanted it to mm. happen. Or you could say what St. Paul says in Galatians, with hi theological hindsight, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. So I, I, I quite agree, it is as though and I'm sure the early Christians yeah. would say this, the history of God and the world, mm -hmm. the history of God and Israel, had strangely been moving towards this point. And it is as though, just as we've been talking about needing to go through Good Friday in order to get to Easter, mm 
It is as though the Jews needed to go through the experience of exile mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order then to know that there was a new life the other side, that there was something out beyond which was going to be different. So to pull this together, it seems to me this exercise in ancient history has actually helped us to mm. see back into the world of Jesus, to get away from some of the wrong assumptions that we make because of the way we use the language, and to see that in Jesus' day, this language was very specific and very focused. It was the big picture about what God was going to do for Israel and the world, for the whole cosmos, but also resurrection was not just a loose way of talking about something that happens to me hereafter, by and by, whatever, but was about God remaking human beings, as we might say, re-embodying human beings into a new sort of life to live in the new world that God was going to make. And the question we then have to face once more is, why did the early Christians say that that was what had happened? So we now come to look at the whole question of what the early Christians said had actually happened that had precipitated them on this extraordinary movement that was at once so very Jewish and so very different from anything that any Jews of the time seemed to be expecting. And the first person we're going to look at is Paul. Now you might think that's a little odd because after all Paul is writing after the events which the Gospels say they're describing, but the reason for doing this is quite simple, that we pretty well know that the Gospels as we have them were written down a bit later than Paul, perhaps at the earliest in the 60s of the first century and perhaps at the latest in the 80s or 90s, though that's disputed, whereas Paul is writing most of his letters in what we call the early 50s, in other words within 25 years of Jesus' execution. So we go to Paul to say, well, Paul, will you tell us what you mean when you say that Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead? Now, there's a, a preliminary question before we can really launch into that, because some people have read in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 that Paul is talking about, when I came to Corinth, I said I would know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And they say, well, did Paul not mention the resurrection? And then they've sometimes said, well, you know, he tried talking about the resurrection in Athens and it didn't seem to work. So maybe he went to Corinth and mm -hmm. thought, do the crucifixion here, and that did work. But it can't be like that, because in 1 Corinthians 15, he says to the Corinthians, let me remind you how I preached the gospel. And it's the Messiah died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. That's a reminder of what he'd said. So Paul's gospel always included, we can be safe in saying, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And we'll come back to that bit in 1 Corinthians 15 in a minute. But just to note again something we hinted at earlier, that the resurrection is not something added on to Paul's mm -hmm. theology, bolted on from the outside. It's woven into the very fabric of his thought. So that if you take away the resurrection, all sorts of other stuff just falls apart. In Romans 6, Paul is talking about baptism, and he talks about the resurrection. In Colossians 3, Paul is talking about living Christian ethics, as we would say, and he talks about the resurrection. In Romans 11, he's talking about the future of Israel, and he talks about the resurrection, and so on and so on. But the great passage where Paul deals with the issue front and center is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail. The reason for this is quite simple, that right now there is a lot of confusion in the churches and in popular speech about Paul's view of the resurrection and early Christian views of the resurrection about what precisely Paul meant. And I hear often people saying, and I read people saying, that, oh, well, Paul didn't believe in bodily resurrection. Paul said flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Paul said that Jesus uh, rose into a spiritual body, so therefore it isn't anything physical. Therefore, they say, Paul didn't believe in the empty tomb, so Paul is quite different from, say, Luke and John, who really do seem to believe that Jesus had an actual body which could eat and drink and be touched. Now, why is Paul writing this chapter, which we call 1 Corinthians 15? Of course, as you know, Paul didn't number them like that himself, <laughs> but uh, we call it that for ease of reference. The answer is that the Corinthian Christians to whom he's writing are still only beginning to get their minds round what it means to live within the whole Judeo-Christian worldview. 
they are trying to collapse the message back into a sort of pagan religion. And in that pagan religion, with a bit of Jesus thrown in, there's no place for a resurrection of the body. They wanted some kind of future immortality, perhaps, but not a resurrection. Paul is teaching them to think Jewishly, and then more specifically, he's teaching them to think about the Jewish story of how God is putting the world to rights, and then more specifically, he's thinking, uh, teaching them to think about the Jewish story of how God is putting the world to rights in Jesus. The shorthand that we scholars sometimes use for that bunch of stuff is eschatology, though that word has had such a varied career that we probably shouldn't use it too often. But if you hear it, that's basically what, what I think we're talking about. And in the middle of that, he is trying to address the question which the Corinthians were obviously puzzled by, just like people are today, and rightly, if we're talking about the resurrection of the body, just what sort of a body are we talking about? Now. A very, very quick overview then of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul begins this chapter in the first 11 verses by reminding them of the gospel which he'd preached. As I said, the Messiah died for our sins, was buried, was raised. And he says, according to the scriptures, not that he can find a few little proof texts to back up his argument, but that this is the culmination and climax of the whole story that the scriptures had been telling. And then he marshals evidence. He says, you know, there are 500 people who saw this happen at once, and most of them are still alive. In other words, you can go and ask them. So this can't simply be the sort of general spiritual awareness of Jesus that all Christians have had from that day to this, and that the Corinthians had themselves. This is something different he's talking about, which happened for a short while and then not again. And Paul says, after all, that his experience of seeing Jesus was the last one in the sequence. The Corinthians had had all kinds of Christian experiences, but not that one. Now, after this opening, Paul moves on to set out the basic picture, and he really does this in verses 20 through 28 of 1 Corinthians 15. This is the big story. It's the Jewish story which has reached its climax in Jesus. In the Jewish story, there was this big apocalyptic scenario in which God would defeat the enemies of the people of God and rescue Israel from them. Paul tells the story with Jesus in the middle of it, and now the big enemy is not Rome or anything like that, but death itself. And Paul says that we can see in Jesus that the great moment of victory of God over the forces of evil has split into two. There is victory mark one, and there is victory mark mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. And the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of that. And then we live, he says, in the period between these two victories over death. And then our own resurrection will be the end of it. And put negatively, that is that God is defeating death once and for all and saying, corruption and decay do not have the last word in this universe. Thank you very much. The life-giving God has the last word. Then in the second half of this enormous chapter, enormous by Paul's standards of arguments, uh, Paul addresses the major issue, which is that of what we could call transformed physicality. What is this new body? He says in verses 35 onwards, there are different types of bodies. And in some cases, as with the seed and the plant, there is continuity as well as discontinuity. And what he says in verse 38 is, God gives this plant or whatever a body. Paul isn't saying that the resurrection body grows out of the buried one like a seed growing into a plant. He's illustrating the way in which there can be continuity between different sorts of physicality. And then the main difference between the present body and that which is to come is described in a, a very difficult and, and tricky little passage, which is often, I think, mistranslated. In some of the translations, like this one I've got here, it says that Paul says, the body is sown a physical body and it is raised a spiritual body. And when we hear that phrase, we think physical, that's this stuff that we live in, and spiritual, that is non-physical. But the Greek cannot and doesn't mean that, because the word which is here translated physical is from the word which we would normally translate soul, S-O-U-L. Mm -hmm. So the first body is a soul body, and the coming body is a spirit body. This therefore can't be a reference to the sort of stuff the body is, it's a reference to the thing that, as it were, animates it or holds it in being. 
So the contrast he's making is between our present body, animated by the ordinary human life of the soul, as we might call it, and the future body, animated and held in existence by God's pneuma, God's spirit. So when Paul says in verse 50 that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, he doesn't mean that the resurrection body is what we would call non-physical. He means that it is a transformed physicality, because for Paul, flesh and blood means corruptible, decaying, and often even rebellious as well. And so in the last paragraph of this chapter, verses 50 through 58, Paul says that the body has got to be changed. This is Paul's view of the resurrection. The body is not going to be abandoned, nor is it merely going to be resuscitated. It's going to be transformed. And the fruit of all this, right at the end, the very last verse in the, in the chapter, is when he says, therefore, abound in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The point of that at the end of this great long chapter is to say what you do in the present body matters. What you do in the present body is in continuity mm -hmm. with who you are going to be in the future body. And we can see elsewhere at the end of Philippians chapter 3, the beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, how it is that Paul talks of the present body being changed. Paul thus holds, I believe, to a robustly bodily view of the resurrection. He's worked it through thoroughly with lots of exegetical detail passages from the Old Testament coming out of his ears as he does so. And this is our earliest written witness on the subject. It's a robustly Jewish view. It involves a bodily resurrection. By clear implication, it involves an empty tomb. And this, I believe, is our starting point for looking at the rest of the early Christian evidence but we've already got quite enough on the table, I think, to <laughs> occupy us for the next little while. So, over to you. Tom, mm. I, I think oftentimes it's interesting, uh, I like to say to my congregation that geography is theology, where something happens mm. tells mm. us something about what is being said there. And I think Corinth, being known as the city of two harbors, mm. in a sense it reminds me of what you were just saying, that there's the mark, we live between the Mark I uh -huh. and the Mark uh -huh. II, and in the sense that we are Corinthians, we are struggling on, on the land there, looking at both harbors, uh, living in between this rain. Jesus is the first fruit, has uh, changed something. Uh, We're uh. yearning to swim in that second harbor. Right. I'm wondering what Paul has to say for us now as modern Corinthians living here in North mm -hmm. America, mm -hmm. uh, Great Britain. How do we live with this promise of the resurrection? And, and what is the value, what Paul said to the Corinthians then, to us now? Yeah, I think the biggest single issue here, and this is a kind of a global thing, is that we in the so-called modern Western world have had in the backs of our minds, really ever since your country was founded, a different story, namely that world history reached its climax in Europe and America in the 18th century. Mm. And that, that was where mm. it was all going, the Great Enlightenment. Mm -hmm, yeah. And because we've lived with that story, which now at the mm. end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century, we actually feel is rather an odd story. Uh, as long as we had that in our heads, it was very difficult for us to say, and this is what Paul is saying, that world history actually reached its climax when Jesus of Nazareth came out of the tomb on Easter morning. Mm -hmm. Because we say, well, there's a lot of time since then, and we, they were very funny old people then, they didn't see the world the way we do, da 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 And yet, it seems to me the challenge for us as Christians is to say precisely that these modern stories that we tell about our great enlightenment have to stand under the judgment of God's story, which is a unique story about Jesus himself, that nobody else has been raised from the dead that way. And it often takes a huge effort of imagination to project ourselves into the world where that was the climax of history and that climax will be consummated in the future. So that instead of living out of the dream which said we had the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and we're working towards the period when now this Enlightenment civilization will mm -hmm. permeate the whole world, which is a, a Christian heresy really, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's yeah. the same shape but uh, you're getting it quite wrong, I think. Mm -hmm. We have to live out of the thing which says God has begun the new creation. We are people of the new creation, looking forward to the completion of the new creation, and responsible in the present for bringing bits of that future to birth, here and now. That's the challenge, and it's an, an imaginative challenge as much as a, a sort of a learning theology challenge. Mm -hmm. It surely is, and uh, one of the things that helped me think about this 
wasn't the two Corinthian harbors. Well, that's really very <laughs> m imaginative. <laughs> but uh, the, the truth that in that first Corinthians chapter, it's the ends of the ages in which we live, not the end of right. either one. So we're, mm. and, and that does call for an active imagination because we live in mm. two places at once, imagining and trusting mm. The reality mm. of an age that stretches well beyond us and in directions that perhaps we can't fully know and still resident fully in yes. the one that we live in. There's a, a need for a kind of uh, poetic mm. sensibility, which is one of the things that the Enlightenment seems to have limited to for have screened us. out. Yeah. yeah, that's a real problem. And, mm. and we've tended to read Paul very rationalistically. Uh, and try to line him up in terms of a set of abstract propositions that Paul says A, mm -hmm. B, C, and D, or whatever. And Paul, like Jesus, is often telling stories. Mm -hmm. And we mustn't forget that Paul was mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. things as well, acting symbolically. And what, what he was doing was planting churches in which people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds and, and both genders together mm -hmm. would come together and live as family, which was a deeply countercultural oh. thing to mm -hmm. do in that world. And, and was the symbol that God is creating a new humanity, which he calls the body of Christ, a new person. And if we say, why did Paul believe that God was creating that new humanity? It's because Jesus is raised from the dead. It's as easy as that. Well, as easy as that. Mm -hmm. And so, so, yes, we need the poetics. We need all the resources of imagination and music and art. And the medieval church got a lot to teach us on mm -hmm. this, I think, the way they taught people. To, con to reconstruct an, imagina an imaginative world, not an imaginary world, as mm -hmm. though it was a fictitious yes, world, yes. but imaginative world which will actually enable us to grasp and be grasped by the truth. Mm -hmm. That's how I've yeah. always understood the corn and seed illustration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, I, I hadn't really thought about it in terms of continuity and discontinuity, mm -hmm. but in terms of the fact that if you looked at a corn plant, could you imagine from what mm. it had come. And if you yeah. looked at a little corn seed, and it was mm -hmm. the only, th what we see. Uh, yeah, and that's right. If somebody, said, if somebody said to you, yeah. do you know this is going to turn into a piece of barley right. this long, yeah. you'd say, oh, yeah, oh, give, yeah. give, give oh. me a break. <laughs> and there's that kind of, well, I, I know what we look like, mm. and I know that this will look other, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't know what. Yeah. I yes, don't know yes. What. It seems another quirk or serendipitous element of, of Scripture, and, and Paul, the example, being a tent maker. Yes. Growing around uh -huh. and, and uh -huh. the faith going uh -huh. from a geocentric Jerusalem, that's where the action is. Mm -hmm. And this tent maker who creates it where you are, the spirit is there and embodying right. uh, the temple, which is the body, and that is good. Right. A and of course, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul uses exactly the image of the tent. Mm -hmm. He says, This present tent that we live in, if that is destroyed, mm -hmm. what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very interesting. I'm not sure if he intends all of this illusion, but I just hear it as an echo there that he says we have a building not made with hands ready to be given to us. And uh, you see, he says, unlike the Greek world, we don't want to be unclothed. That is to put off the body and have a bare soul. Mm -hmm. We want to be more fully clothed. And I, I wonder if he's thinking of the Jewish story of the tabernacle in the wilderness, mm -hmm. which yeah. finally mm -hmm. comes to Jerusalem mm -hmm. and is replaced with the, the yeah. physical temple. Yeah. And, and the, the whole image, I, you know, we sometimes speak of somebody who's been very sick as being a shadow of his yeah, former, former self, self or her former mm -hmm. self. And I think what Paul is saying is that you may think you're solid flesh and blood at the moment, but in fact you're just a shadow of your future self. There is something That's more right. real mm -hmm. and more dynamic and attractive and exciting and vibrant and full of life. And if only we could re-envisage and reimagine that, I think a lot of people's view of what our own future life would be like, let alone what Jesus' body was like, would be quite significantly different. There's a sense of stewardship that comes to me. Uh, yeah. If the body is good, mm -hmm. and if it will be raised again, mm -hmm. and there will be a corporal sense, then what we do now does make a difference. Yes. I think I heard you say. Yes. And, yes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's very interesting. That last verse of 1 Corinthians 15, I, I confess I've been living off this and preaching from it for, for some little mm -hmm. while now, just this last year or so. Because, you see, if I was writing a great treatise on the resurrection, which actually I intend to before very long, hopefully, <laughs> um, 
the implication in our world is that you would end by saying, therefore, that's your future, that's what you've got to hope for, look mm -hmm. for it and, and all the rest of it. Paul instead brings it right back down to the now mm -hmm. and says, therefore, because of all this argument about the mm -hmm. resurrection, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, when you do acts of justice and mercy, and when you create beauty, when as scholars we try and write about truth, um, and when you live a life of holiness, you are not simply oiling the wheels of a machine that is one day going to mm. go off a cliff and who mm -hmm. cares. You know, if you were living in the, the pagan Greek world, they would say, well, who cares what we do with the body? Mm -hmm. Who cares whether we uh, build up community here or whatever because we're all going to be disembodied souls one day? Mm -hmm. No, Paul says, it matters what you do in the present will last. Mm. Ha and the other passage which really helps me on this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where um, Paul talks about laying a foundation in verse mm -hmm. 10 mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. building Very on good. it. Yeah. And the point is that if you build with gold and silver and precious stones, which is again a temple building image, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that those substances, that work will last. How mm -hmm. that will be, we do not know. You know, how it can be that the act of mercy or the passion for justice which we put into operation now will be re-embodied in God's new world. W we don't know, but according to this, it will be. And what we do here really will last. And, and even in some ways is already part of that experience of God's new world, that, that sense in which Paul says in 1 Corinthians, your body, plural you, yes, yes. is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. And you have that yes. sensibility already that right. some yeah. of that gold and silver and precious stone is laid. And mm -hmm. if it's burned, I, yeah. Paul talks about that, that you can imagine that refiner's fire image right. coming, mm -hmm. which is essentially, I guess, no matter what happens, yes. that will not be destroyed. Yes. So yes. it does precisely bear that out. That's right. So for Paul, uh, the image of a, a cosmic fire, which people sometimes in apocalyptic or Armageddon speculation sort of think about the great fire which is coming, you know, there's biblical passages that talk about that. Paul says, nevertheless, what you build here as Christians in Christ and in the power of the Spirit will come through that fire. And there is continuity. It's not that God is going to chuck the whole cosmos right. in the trash can and do something totally different. There will be continuity. We've got to hang on to that as part of our Christian ecological responsibility as well as personal in the present time. Mm. Do you think there was a connection between Paul's grasp of the crucifixion and resurrection, how they went together, you're suggesting, and the way he writes throughout his letters of that, as scholars will say, the indicative, the imperative, where he lays forth, this is what has done, been done by God through Jesus Christ. And then he always has that turn, therefore... Yes, yes, uh, yes. Oh, to be sure. and. Uh, I think the problem that we have with handling this sometimes is that in our culture, people have split off statements of the way the world is from statements mm -hmm. of how we should be, its fact and value or whatever mm -hmm. you like. Mm -hmm. And often people say, it's great gulf between these and never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. But in fact, in God's mm -hmm. world, in the biblical world, in the Jewish world, in Paul's world, the fact is we are living within a story. And the story is God's story with the world, with Israel, with Jesus. And we are part of that story. Mm -hmm. And so that which has happened is part of our family history, part of our personal history. And we are called to live lives of integrity in terms of that family history. So it's not there is this abstract statement from which we can deduce this mm -hmm. moral duty today. It's we must live as part of this story. And we are making new story for mm -hmm. others who come after us to live by as well. That's very, very significant for Paul. It is significant for Paul, and he is so insistent. I, I was driven to look at the uh, early part of Romans 12, where oh, yeah. you know, um, don't be shaped according to this yeah. age. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have a problem with age sometimes. It, yes. That's that attempt to yes. either be mm -hmm. geographical about where heaven is or mm -hmm. chronological about, and not somehow understand that we're talking about two different ways of seeing or being seen by, to sound Pauline, mm. reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so we are to be 
reshaped. Yes, and it's very interesting, that reshaped. word reshaped uh, in, in the Greek and however you translate it, transformed or whatever, yes. it's very close to what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 yes. about we shall be changed mm -hmm. and it's very close to what he says in Philippians 3 about uh, that Jesus will transform mm -hmm. our present body. Mm -hmm. And the exciting thing about that passage in Romans 12, I'm grateful to you for bringing it up, is that he says this transformation which God will effect at the end is to infect you now, now. Exactly. and there where is that so. infection, that resurrection to happen? In mm -hmm. the mind. He says be transformed by the renewal, mm -hmm. another resurrection mm -hmm. word, of the mind so that you may understand what God's will is. And that doesn't just mean, you know, what I should do today, tomorrow, etc. Mm -hmm. Understand the whole counsel and purpose and yeah. plan of God. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important and ask you to talk yeah. just a little bit more because I think we do tend mm -hmm. to say the resurrection is what will happen when I die. Yeah, yeah. And I sense from Paul it, it washes over yeah, us yeah, yeah. and it changes who we are now because the re right. we are resurrected in a sense right, right, right now. Well, yes, and of course there the key passage would be Romans 6 or Six. Colossians 3. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And what you find is yeah, th there's a kind of an oscillation yeah. between yes. those who say resurrection is all about my future mm -hmm. and those who say resurrection is all about Jesus' past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and both of those are true, but because both of those are true, yeah, it, it's all about the here and now. Mm -hmm. um, and the key thing there is Paul hooks it in with baptism, mm. and in baptism he is using Exodus language mm -hmm. um, as he does in 1 Corinthians 10 about coming out of Egypt through the water mm -hmm. and on through the wilderness to the promised land. And I'm convinced that Romans 6 shares that same narrative, that this event which links you to Jesus' death and resurrection mm -hmm. means that you are now Exodus people, pilgrim people, um, going to the promised land people, mm -hmm. and therefore you must live as people who have left Egypt behind, right. mm -hmm. you know, that you no longer belong in the land of slavery. And right. that's how his ethical appeal, as we call it, mm -hmm. works in mm -hmm. Romans 6. And then in Colossians 3, very interestingly, it says you have died and your life is now hidden in. with mm -hmm. Christ in God. Mm -hmm. Very dense little bit of language. He says, when Christ who is our life appears, mm -hmm. then you will appear with him. In other words, your true life is already somehow bound up with Christ, the risen Christ, in the heavenly places with God. So that, I think, really ties the whole thing together. What we've got is past, mm. future, yeah. and then present coming at us from the one end, coming at us from the other. In a sense, that's, of course, what the Christian sacraments are all about. We've mentioned yes, baptism, yes, yes. but the Eucharist as well proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Yeah. It's a bit of, the Eucharist is a bit of the future coming forward to meet us in the present, just like it's the Last Supper coming from the past mm -hmm. to sustain us in the present. And uh, so we've, we've got here a, a little paradigm, a little model or map of the Christian life that we live in this odd interval in God's purpose and history between the resurrection of Jesus in the past and our own future resurrection and God's remaking of the whole world in the future. And these two together hold us in a newly storied world, a new imaginative world in which we can live and work as Christians and in which we know that what we do in the present is not in vain, is not going to be thrown away. We are building, hopefully, with gold and silver and precious stones. And when the day appears, then that work will appear with it. We're now going to look at the Gospels and see what they have to say about the resurrection. Now, one of the interesting things there right off the top is that though the Gospels are written uh, considerably later than Paul, as most people think, the stories they tell are very simple, and we'll come to that in a minute. There's an odd to and fro that we have to do between the Gospels and Paul to try to work out what it was they were both talking about. And it's interesting, while we're on introductory matters, to notice that none of the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, describes the resurrection itself. They None of them describe Jesus coming out of the tomb or Jesus waking up, if you like, in the tomb. They describe what happened next with people discovering an empty tomb and then strangely meeting the risen Jesus. Now, various things to say about the Gospels as a whole. The first, which is quite important, is that they are clearly not made up simply to fit with a standard Jewish explanation. We said before yeah. that the big text 
for Jews of this period and later was Daniel chapter 12, which has the righteous shining like stars in the kingdom of the Father. If you were a Jew wanting to make up a story saying that Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead, highly likely you'd have had him shining like a star. He doesn't do that, which mm. is very interesting. These stories are clearly belonging within the Jewish world of storytelling, like times when God does something dramatic in the Old Testament, but they're not the sort of stories you would expect them to make up about resurrection. Likewise, they are quite unlike the pagan stories in which recently departed heroes uh, may come back as apparitions or whatever. Thirdly, and this I think is very important for comparing the Gospels with Paul, the Gospels are quite free of Old Testament allusions and echoes in mm. the resurrection narratives themselves. We're not here talking about uh, a weaving together of, of this or that Old Testament text. And that's the more interesting because Paul has a great deal of uh, Old Testament coming mm -hmm. through Definitely. and the Gospels up until that point, including the Passion narratives, mm -hmm. have been full of the Old Testament. It looks as though they're really quite sort of clean and clear very interesting that. The next thing to say is that the Gospels emphasize the element of surprise. It's quite clear that the disciples weren't expecting it. They didn't say, oh yeah, fine, he told us he'd be rising again and here mm. he is, guess mm -hmm. what? Uh, they were shocked and horrified and, and couldn't figure out what it was all about. And there's another thing to notice about what they all say. They all talk about the women going to the tomb. And this, for somebody in the first century, is just all wrong. It's upside down and inside out for this reason, that whether we like it or not, mm. if you were giving witnesses in a court of law in the ancient world, you would not use women because they were not regarded as reliable testimony. And yet these Gospels insist that the women were the first there and they were the first ones to tell the story about meeting these women. So that if you imagine somebody sitting down 10, 20, 30 years later to invent a story about Jesus being raised from the dead, you sure as anything wouldn't have put those women front and center on it. Then I want to insist the stories are at their strangest when they are hinting at the nature of Jesus' body. And this ties in with what we were saying before with Paul about this transformed physicality. They clearly want to say it's the same body because he's got the marks in his mm. hands and feet and his side, but it seems to have different properties so that it can now pass <laughs> through locked doors and that sort of thing, and it's not immediately recognized. You know, in John, it says, none of them dared ask him, who are you? Because mm they knew it was the Lord. It's a very odd thing to say about somebody yes, that they've is. been with face to face for years. It's the same Jesus yet somehow transformed, but not transformed into a kind of glowing, shining astral being wearing a halo and all the kit. Something different again. Now, do you see what's happened? These stories are about a transformed physicality, which is what Paul was talking about, and yet they don't have any of that developed theological reflection and exegetical use of scripture, which we already find in the 50s with Paul, how then do we explain the rise of these stories? You've either got to say that four people independently, post-Paul, mm -hmm. wrote stories designed to encapsulate what Paul was saying, but carefully took out all the theology and exegesis, or you've got to say that these stories, though they were written down a lot later than Paul, actually go back to the eyewitness testimony of people before they've had a chance to go back and think about the Bible or about what it all means, saying to each other, you're not gonna believe this, but mm. let me tell you, this is just how it was. And that's the mood that I think I find there. You see, people often say, I had a letter from somebody just the other day who had read something I'd written about the resurrection, and he said, surely what's going on is that Luke and John are writing at the end of the century and they're the ones who have this very physical risen Jesus because by then there were some people who were saying maybe Jesus wasn't a real human being. He only seemed to be human. And so Luke and John invent these physical resurrection stories to counteract that. Frankly, if that's what Luke and John are doing, they really shot themselves in the foot mm. because if you want to prove that Jesus is a real human being just like us, you don't have him appearing and disappearing and going through locked doors and stuff. So I think whatever the account we give of how those stories came to be, that actually won't do. So what can we then say about the puzzles and problems of the gospel accounts? 
you know, John has him in Jerusalem and in Galilee. Luke just has him in Jerusalem. Mark and Matthew say he was in Galilee. It's a bit of a puzzle. And it's difficult to say exactly how many women went to the tomb and which angels mm -hmm. they saw there mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's very confusing. But, you know, in the same way, if you try to put together the accounts of the cock crowing when Peter denied Jesus, you can't do it. You have to say something like the croc cock crowed nine mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. which none of the accounts <laughs> say. And yet mm -hmm. I'm jolly sure that there was a cock crowing mm -hmm. while it was going on. And in the same way, a compare newspaper reports of the same event, they all disagree, but that doesn't mean nothing happened. And in the same way, I think mm. these accounts are the sort of eyewitness accounts that say uh, it's all very quick and breathless and, and you know, mm. we may have got some of the details inside out, but that doesn't mean that it was all made up 20 years later, very far from it. Mm. Now, of course, Matthew and Mark are very similar accounts, but then Mark breaks off. I do think, actually, that Mark did have a longer ending, which we've now lost. Um, Luke tells his story as the story of the new creation. It's uh, a kind of an opening up of a new world. The Emmaus Road story sets the tone for the life of the church, the scriptures and the breaking of the bread. And John has this series of character vignettes, Thomas and Mary and so on. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful set of images there which they are just starting to develop so that John's invitation, come and have breakfast, sounds to me like the mm. invitation to anyone who has toiled all night and taken nothing and now mm. needs to meet the mysterious stranger on the beach. So this is all pointing on to the question which we'll do next time, which is uh, the whole question of what we make of this. But clearly there's so much in these strange gospel stories, we need to kick it around a bit. I think it's curious that we have four Gospels and not just one. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that just briefly? <laughs> I think you suggested there's the variety there. Mm -hmm. Was the church not uncomfortable in saying perhaps we should select this one and let the other ones ride? Well, of course, there were some people in the second and third century who said it would be much neater to have just one. There was mm -hmm. a famous guy called Tatian who made a composite edition, as some people have tried to do since. Mm -hmm. but. Most of the early Christians known to us on through the next century or two basically said, nope, it's these four, that's the way it mm -hmm. should be. They invented grand theories like the four beasts of Ezekiel yeah. and the four winds and so on. But that was kind of an elaborate way of saying something that they knew down here, mm -hmm. that this fourfold witness gives us the full Jesus, the full story. Of course, this is a much bigger question than just the resurrection narratives. But, uh, you know, it's like biographies. I've got four or five biographies of C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis, and they mm -hmm. each tell me something about the man mm -hmm. which the other ones don't. And some of them may have got it a bit distorted. I don't know. I didn't know Lewis myself. I wish I did. But um, I think they're all giving us quite valid windows because human beings in general mm -hmm. are highly complex creatures. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, though a very integrated human being, seems to have been a very complex man as well. Mm -hmm. You can tell the story this way, you can tell it that way. So, of course, the other question is, what about Thomas or Q or all mm -hmm. this other stuff? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if Q existed, and, and I, I'm a heretic on that, mm -hmm. but um, I think that Thomas was considerably later than the canonical Gospels and largely derivative from them, though not maybe entirely. And, of course, other people were trying to tell other stories about Jesus and to make this message serve other worldviews. Mm. And we could get into that, but perhaps yeah. not now, because they don't talk about the resurrection. It is interesting that in spite of the variety of ways that story gets shaped by mm -hmm. where disciples finally find themselves at the end of Gospels and that sort mm -hmm. of thing, mm -hmm. there are so many similar elements. Yes. And some of those are um, the kind of continuity that you would expect in a Jewish tradition, so that women as not good witnesses, um, but still the ones who would go to anoint a dead body. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so it, right. there's a very uh -huh. similitude there. There's yes. something uh -huh. like truth being told yes. there, yes. Um, and uh, and it works. And 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 though Jesus doesn't dazzle, yes. the messengers do. Yes, and that's yes. right yes. out yes. of the long story yes. of the way God's messengers sometimes appear to people and uh, and so yeah. the people who go to the tomb are able to yes. imagine that these messengers come yeah. 
from some place they don't exactly know. They they know enough to be afraid. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Now that that's it's extremely wonderful. interesting because it, they are at one level very biblical stories, and yet nobody in the Old Testament um, ever rises from the dead. Exactly. Like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a new it's, thing. They didn't wonderful. make it up out of the scriptures uh, by just saying let's tell one of those stories again. And yet it belongs in that Jewish world. And you, I have a sense that in our culture today, a lot of people are more open mm. to not only angels, but to God doing things that we didn't expect. You know, when I was growing up, mm. it was very much, we know miracles don't occur, and there it is. Mm -hmm. And there are still quite a lot of people who take that line. But there are now quite a lot who, for sometimes for Christian reasons, sometimes for New Age reasons or whatever, are saying, oh, the world is a very mysterious place. Mm -hmm. you know, people do get to walk on water sometimes, and so on and so forth. But usually, in my experience, even people who say that balk at saying that actually Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly, that is what all four of those Gospels are saying. I'm wondering if you could imagine there having been written a Gospel without the resurrection narratives. There's mm -hmm. a lot of material there about his teaching, about his healing, um, mm -hmm. about his interacting with the religious authorities. Was that not a significant story yeah. in and of itself? Well, it would have been. It could have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, let's just try to imagine yeah. for a moment, supposing the resurrection or n nothing like it had ever occurred, mm -hmm. then it seems to me that for a short while, maybe even for a generation, the people who had followed Jesus might well have told stories about him. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that Josephus, the Jewish historian writing a generation later, tells the story, difficult to know exactly what he means by it all, mm -hmm. of Jesus who was a good man and did certain mm -hmm. things, etc. And then Josephus says at the end, and the funny thing is, you know, the tribe of these Christians has still not died out. Mm -hmm. Isn't that odd? Mm -hmm. right. um, and you can imagine people telling those stories about mm -hmm. this extraordinary man who was around for a while. Yeah. But they wouldn't have the same feel or flavor. Mm -hmm. They would actually be rather like, if you think of the Old Testament as a whole story, mm -hmm. it is a story in search of an ending. It's waiting for something mm. to happen. Mm -hmm. Because you see, yes. if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, whatever you would have written, it couldn't have been a gospel because the word gospel means good news. Mm. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what you have is something which isn't good news, namely another failed messianic movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, there would have been stories, there could have been stories, they could have gone on telling them for a while, mm -hmm. but it would have been, uh, a poignant memory. Yeah. It would not have been a gospel. Or even a provocative one. It could have been a provocative memory, It could yes. be yes. prophecy according yeah. to Jesus, yes. Mm -hmm. and yes. along with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Yes, and, yes, um, they, they might, they might have said that. And a calling to Israel. Yeah, uh, or, it, or it could have collapsed into being a version of Plato's picture of Socrates. Mm -hmm. You know, Socrates' death was very tragic, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the end of philosophy. We could still, and he was going to die sometime anyway, and mm -hmm. so we could carry on. Um, or a Maccabean yeah. martyr story, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. it, it, tortured by the Romans and still unwilling to renounce. That's right, but, but the Maccabean martyr stories are still not the good news. I right. mean, the good news is an Isaiah word mm -hmm. w as well as a Caesar word, and it means <laughs> something has happened which has broken into God's world as a mm -hmm. result of which everything's different. Mm -hmm. And the, the death of another Messiah, however interesting and fascinating a character he was, mm -hmm. would, would not be, be just that good news. Be bad same news. old thing. Exactly. Yeah. We, we've had yeah. those before. And, and that's the curious thing. I know that uh, a number of people have uh, read and heard about the Jesus Seminar mm -hmm. and, and these theologians trying to find out what the power of Jesus is, but it seems as I've read through it, they've taken so much of the material that guts out of it, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. not left with much and in a sense of a Jesus who does not rise from mm -hmm. the dead. Mm -hmm. um, how are you working with that? Well, yes, I, I mean, the Jesus Seminar made, so to speak, yeah. no bones of the fact that they were uh, starting with the assumption that dead people don't rise, mm -hmm. and that therefore the stories must really mean something else. And mm -hmm. there are dozens of different ways of doing that. Uh, several scholars who we could name um, have tried different ways of saying that it was because they studied the scriptures so assiduously mm -hmm. that uh, they found this business of the third day in Hosea. So they wrote stories okay. about the third day. Mm -hmm. and. And, you know, it's just actually wildly implausible. Um, they even went to the lengths, the Jesus Seminar, of um, uh, bringing a young woman who worked in, in a mortuary to testify to the Jesus Seminar that she had examined a lot of dead bodies, and when they were dead, they tended to stay dead. Oh and, and, you know, th this, this, <laughs> was a this was supposed to be a great sort of science. Now, we are scientists today, we know this. Yeah. And, and the silly thing yeah. is that the early Christians would have said to a man and to a woman, mm -hmm dead people stay dead. Mm -hmm. And this was different. They mm -hmm. didn't say, oh, this stuff happens all over the place. Mm 
That's right. And uh, the, it, is, it is precisely part of the gospel that it doesn't happen to everyone else, yeah. but that it jolly well did to Jesus. It's hard to know quite, quite where to go with that <laughs> for, yeah. for many people, I yeah. think, in this day and age. On the one hand, it's so implausible, and it was so long ago, and mm -hmm. what can it possibly mean for us? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, that sense of the world changing so fast mm -hmm. so that some of us find ourselves mystified by inventions uh, mm -hmm. in our own lifetime mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. expect to be fully mystified mm -hmm. by ones that come in yes, the next. Yes. It gives us yes. a little more room to it, think it may, about yep. mystery and change. And I, I would agree with that, though I've discovered that even quite a few people who are open to new mystery and new change and so on still do draw the line at the bodily mm -hmm. resurrection. Uh, one friend of mine will be open to all sorts of things, but will say, I just don't think God does that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, where it comes from. For a lot of people, mm -hmm. it goes with a view of God, and they're frightened yes, that if they I'll buy into agreeing that the mm -hmm. Gospels were really telling it like it was, what they're saying is that there is a God who is an intervening God, one who reaches in from outside to do different things. Mm -hmm. And I want to say as clearly as I can, that's not the picture in the New Testament because the God of the New Testament, like the God of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. is not a God who is normally outside the process and who occasionally reaches in and intervenes, mm -hmm. but a God who is always mysteriously present. And sometimes that mysterious presence is a grieving presence because of the awful things that are going on and God suffering with the world. Other times that is a powerful presence where God, the present God, does things that we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me the whole story of Israel is about a series of climaxes of God doing some little things we didn't expect, building up to something big which we really would never have imagined. Mm -hmm. And finally, it looks as though he did that in such a striking way with the resurrection of Jesus. I've had students raise the issue that if God is a suffering God and suffers with us, what good is God? Mm. Where is the power of God to change mm. things? It, it's a, it's a two-edged sword, that, isn't it? Because yes, it is. actually, you know, one of my favorite of the First World War poems um, is called Jesus of the Scars by Edmund Silito, and uh, he talks about the other gods versus Jesus. And he says, the other gods were strong. And he's a First World War poet, you know, he was thinking about the powers of military yeah. might. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode but thou didst stumble to a throne. And then he says, from the depths of the trenches in the First World War, but to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. Mm. And not mm. a God has wounds, but thou alone. Mm. It's a wonderful poem. But this is the distinctive thing about this God, that this is the God who suffers mm. with his people. But then, of course, the resurrection says mm -hmm. that this God suffers in order to take the evil and pain of the world onto himself and to deal with it. It's not just that God is wallowing there along with us. With us. It's that God is taking it and coming through the other side. And to have a powerful God who strode through the world, you know, ignoring suffering to right and left, no thank you. That's, that's not the God we, we need. So without the, the resurrection, yeah. that suffering God is the, the, without the resurrection, the suffering God would, would God just be a pantheistic, yes. a rather sort of negative pantheistic yes. God, a rather technical term. I feel God your pain. Yeah, yeah. That's, God. that's right. <laughs> well, gee, thanks. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Exactly. But, and that's why the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, as we've got it in the mm -hmm. gospel traditions, really resonates out in all sorts of directions. As we were saying before, if it's going to make sense, it must make sense within the world of the first century. Mm -hmm. But then since the Jews believed that God had called Israel to be the light of the world, it must yeah. then make sense in and for the whole cosmos out beyond. And uh, that's what the early Christians discovered with this real sense of excitement that, hey, you tell this story on the street in Corinth or Athens mm -hmm. or Rome, and some people will say you're out of your mind, and other people will find that when you tell that story, strange things happen mm. to them, and they find they believe it. And you know, a lot of early Christian faith, I think, takes the form of, I think this is probably crazy, but mm. it's just got me by the guts, and mm -hmm. this is where I am now. And Paul says, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And they find as they are grasped in that way that their lives are changed, and their priorities are reordered, and they start to pray in new ways, and all sorts of things happen. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering how that happens in our own day when we've heard these stories mm. so mm. much. Yeah. 
stained glass window words. Yeah, yeah. You yes. You see them and you where, don't. Where yeah. comes the surprise now mm -hmm. for us or what we didn't expect? Mm -hmm. Well, of mm -hmm. course that's what God did. Mm -hmm. and it, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we, we speak to two quite different constituencies or audiences. On the one hand, there are the residual skeptics, and there are millions of them in our mm -hmm. country, which oh say, we know God didn't do this, it's just yeah. an old fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, as you say, there are, if, you, I, if I dare say, the bored Christians mm -hmm. who say, oh, we've, mm -hmm. heard, we've yeah. heard all this before. Yeah. Okay, it's Easter, it's Easter eggs and bunnies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's when I want yeah. to say, again, as we said before, learn to read John's Gospel as poetry. And that doesn't mean it didn't happen but learn to feel the poetry and the metaphorical levels. I had an email from somebody not long ago who was saying, is it possible to believe both that it actually happened and that it has all these wonderful layers mm -hmm. of meaning? Mm -hmm. And I said, of course, that's what the whole Bible is about, things that actually happen that have wonderful oh, layers yeah. of meaning. Mm -hmm. And we have split off event from meaning in our culture, and that's disastrous, and it's precisely mm -hmm. something like the resurrection, which is pulling it back together again. Mm -hmm. See, for me, one of the real magic moments in this whole story is the burial and then the resurrection of Jesus, mm -hmm. because the way John tells the story, John is very alert to uh, symbolisms of number, mm. and his, uh, there's lots of sevens in John's sure. Gospel. And I think John is very clear that Jesus rose from the dead very early in the morning on the first day of the week. And that means this is the beginning of a new creation. Mm -hmm. What does that say about Jesus' burial? It says that on the seventh day, God rested in the tomb. And this is like the mm. work of creation is now mm -hmm. finished. On the cross, Jesus says it's accomplished, it's finished. Mm -hmm. and, and now God is resting in the tomb. And now the new creation mm -hmm. is beginning. And as soon as you see that, then, you know, with every sunrise, from where I live, I can watch the sun rising over the sea in the morning. And often I am just struck by the power of that imagery of the new day. And John is saying, that's what's happening for the whole cosmos when Jesus rose again. You know, it's not just Easter eggs, fluffy chicks, and new spring bonnets for ladies in church. We're talking about the beginning of God's new world, and you are the mm -hmm. beneficiaries and the agents of it. So that's where I would start to, to shake people out of their slumbers and mm -hmm. to say, hey, this Easter message has actually got something in it mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. But we're going to need new stories and new yeah. art and new poetry and new music mm -hmm. to do that. One of, the, uh, one of the college teachers in one of the American colleges that I know said that his biggest struggle with students was that they would come into his class, and he taught in the religion mm -hmm. department. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what courses he taught. Students would come and they would have two ideas about how to think about truth. One was scientific truth uh -huh. that would be presumably experientially verifiable or not, mm -hmm. and the other was um, objective history. Mm. which oh, uh, oh, could right. be said to really have happened. Mm -hmm. And yeah. everything else wasn't somehow true. Uh, mm -hmm. yes, yes, and that's, yes. that is a tremendously Th difficult that, place. That Your is, question yeah. typifies it. That, that, is, that is devastating, and it seems to me it points us to something which I think Jesus' resurrection can really help us with, and that is a sense of how we know things. Yes, And really we right. live at a point in our culture where I think it's a good thing that people are asking the question again, how do we know things? Because mm -hmm. I, I grew up in exactly that world. There was stuff that could basically be put in a test tube or its historical equivalent. Mm -hmm. And then there was fuzzy stuff like aesthetics, you know, beauty mm -hmm. and, and love and all those things. And there's one of the great Roman Catholic philosophers of the last generation, Bernard Lonergan, stood that stuff on its head. He said, actually, the prime mode of knowing is love. Mm -hmm. And I find, as I read the resurrection stories, that they do to me rather what Paul says in, in Galatians at one point, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. They are about the love of the Creator God saying to the whole cosmos, it's okay, mm -hmm. I've got you, we're coming through this mm -hmm. one, you yeah. know. Beautiful. And uh, you can't put that into a test tube, it's mm -hmm. far more important yeah. than that, far more important than that. And I want to say, that, you know, the beauty of music, of scenery, of, of literature, of a sunrise is actually far more important than stuff that you can just uh, put a tick beside as a little mm -hmm. proposition here and there. And, and you see, this, this is what the resurrection does, and I think this is what the gospel writers are saying the resurrection does. They're taking the Jewish stories, 
and they're retelling those Jewish stories as focused on and climaxing in Jesus. And then they're showing that all of that led to the cross. And then they're saying, now there is a whole new world. That whole new world began on Easter morning. It is continuing with the work of the Spirit, God's Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, giving new life to people and to the world now. It will reach its own consummation in God's eventual new world. But in this process, although of course we learn to be suspicious of knowledge of this sort and that and to test things out, we are basically offered a way of looking at the world which is a way modeled on love, on the love of God for creation, on the love of God for Jesus, and on that Jesus-shaped, suffering and victorious love of God coming out through Jesus, coming out of the tomb on Easter morning to say to us, it's okay, we're coming through this one, and you are my people now for the world. So what are we going to say for ourselves after all this historical argument about what Jews believed, what Paul said, what the gospel writers did? How can we, as persons living in the late modern or even the postmodern world, so-called, how can we talk sense and meaningful sense for us today about Jesus and the resurrection? Of course, it's difficult to account for the rise of Christianity without the explanation mm -hmm. that the early Christians offered. That's the big historical question, I think. How else do you put that package together? Mm -hmm. I've seen it's very difficult to account for the rise of the resurrection stories or of Paul's developed theology of resurrection unless you say that something actually happened. Because those early Christians all believed that the new age that the Jews had been longing for and waiting for had already arrived. And since it hadn't in the sense that they were expecting, you've got to say something to explain why they said that it had and why they acted as if it had. Because people could say various things, but it's when they actually start doing things mm. that you know that they really mean it. The early church said that in Jesus, the resurrection had arrived. Why? The view that I take in company with millions of reasonably orthodox Christians around the world and from that day to this is that they meant what they said, that it wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't a rather fuzzy way of saying, we now know Jesus in the sacraments or in our prayer life or whatever. Something actually happened, an event on Easter morning. And that, I believe, is the best way of running this whole argument. However, there are some interesting little bits of circumstantial evidence as well. For instance, the fact that the early Christians shifted the day of worship from the Saturday to the Sunday. That is a huge symbolic change, very hard to achieve in a culture, mm -hmm. but they did it just yeah. like that overnight, even though, of course, Sunday was the first day of their working week. So if you wanted to worship on a Sunday, that meant you had to get up extra early. And in yeah. our culture, again, we know yeah. how difficult it is yeah. to persuade people to get up extra yeah. early for almost anything, except possibly to go fishing or play golf. Um, there is also, and a lot of people don't know this, the fact that when they buried Jesus, this was not like a burial today where somebody gets put in a coffin and then put in a tomb and that's it. This was the first stage of a two-stage burial. This was how they did it. They would wrap the body in a cloth and put spices and so on on because they were going to lay this body in a cave, and on, on a ledge in a cave. That they would be coming back from that uh, to that cave again and again um, to bury other people over the next year or so and at a certain point they would look at that body and say it's all the flesh is now decomposed we must now collect the bones and put them in a bone box which they called an ossuary and then they would rebury that ossuary now you imagine people coming and going and eventually saying well Jesus is finally decomposed we've got to bury his bones then the game would be over all those early Christians who'd been going around yeah. saying Jesus was alive again well he manifestly obviously wouldn't have been and it's when you understand how the first century Ju of Judaism works like that you start to see how difficult it is to say that Christianity began but Jesus bones were still in the tomb somewhere now the big question may well be for many people what is the meaning of all this for today I once heard an eminent scholar say well so Jesus did rise again from the dead if he did big deal nice for Jesus but what's in it for the rest of us that totally misses the point 
You see, many people, I've heard lots of Easter sermons too in churches, many people say this kind of thing that uh, Jesus' resurrection means that there really is a life after death and we can share it. Well, most of the people in Judaism believed that anyway. That wasn't what they concluded from Jesus' resurrection. Or I've heard people say in sermons and so on, well, it means that Jesus is alive today and we can get to know him. Now, mm -hmm. that is true. It's a glorious truth. But that's more to do with Pentecost and the Spirit making mm -hmm. Jesus present to us rather than the truth of Easter itself. Mm -hmm. And some people say, mm -hmm. well, Easter means that the, the, the supernatural world really does exist or there really is an interventionist God who steps in and does miracles and all of that. That's not what they said. This is the mysterious, powerful work of the God who is always present. And the distinction between natural and supernatural that we often make in our culture, I think is not a very biblical way of looking at it. The Bible talks about heaven and earth as the two dimensions mm -hmm. of God's reality. And that doesn't always sit exactly with what people mean mm -hmm. by natural and supernatural. Rather, the central point of the resurrection is, I believe, that the new creation, the new age, has already begun. And this is the new age promised by the prophets through which God's justice and peace are going to embrace the world at last. This has begun, and we are the people who have got to take it forward until it's finished. Because within that, the New Testament sees the resurrection as bringing into being the new covenant community, which we loosely call the church. Those who are buried and raised with Jesus in baptism and those who share Jesus' bread and cup in the Eucharist are constituted by faith as the people of the resurrection, standing on resurrection ground, constituted as God's renewed people for the world. And within that, again, within the new creation and the new community, there are new human beings. We spoke before about Paul saying, I want you to be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you may now prove in experience what mm. God intends human beings to be. There is a new, a new form, a new model of humanness, and we are invited and welcomed in to sharing it. Because, you see, the future hope of Christians is finally clarified by Jesus' resurrection. It isn't just Jesus was raised, therefore we will go to heaven when we die. No, the hope is for new heavens and new earth, for this reintegration of the two dimensions of God's created order. Mm. And this means that when we talk about those who have died, and when we preach at funerals, when we do all that sort of stuff, we're not just saying, oh well, one day we'll see these people again in heaven, heaven. or whatever. We are talking about a rest a time of refreshment, of light and peace after death, and then after that again, resurrection into God's new world. The word paradise, you know when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, the word paradise is not the final resting place, place of the blessed I in, in Judaism. Mm. It is the beautiful garden where you go to rest and be refreshed until the time when God makes the new world. Therefore, we have in the resurrection a vision of a new world which has already yeah. begun yeah. and a vision of a new world which is yet to mm -hmm. be, and we have an agenda for the present for new people that we're supposed to be in the power of the Spirit. So where does that all take yeah. us? Well, for me, wow. it's, it goes to uh, an item I think we haven't touched much upon yet, uh, and that has to do with sin. Uh -huh. uh, we've talked about that the resurrection is not just an individual, it's corporate, um, right. that it is the body, not just an ethereal. But what about the day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. struggle that we have just to make mm -hmm. it through day by day without messing up yeah, and yeah. hurting ourselves and hurting other people mm -hmm. and having this incredible sense of, you know, is life worth living? Mm -hmm. it's, it seems that the resurrection has a lot to do, and of course, as Paul makes mm -hmm. reference in Romans 6 with baptism mm -hmm. and also with the Eucharist, mm -hmm. it's... Resurrection is the, is the power through which we are able to have the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that is so dynamic. And, That's and right. Cute. And in 1 Corinthians, he says bluntly, if the Messiah has not been raised, you're wasting your time because yeah. you are still in your sins. It's mm -hmm. a very interesting mm -hmm. thing. It's as though sins were all concentrated on Jesus as mm -hmm. the representative yeah. of Israel, as a representative of the world. And if he's still dead, mm 
it shows that God did not deal with sin mm -hmm. on the cross because sin produces death. So if it's just produced death, the sin is still powerful. Mm -hmm. But if God has brought Jesus back into a new sort of life, mm -hmm. then it means that sins really were dealt with on the cross. And then so mm -hmm. Paul applies that to the Christian life in Romans 6, as you say, and also in Romans 12. And yes, Paul is aware, as aware as the next person that Christians still do sin. But I think the key thing is to ask, where do you live? And back to the mm -hmm. Exodus story, you see, that if you think that you are really living in Egypt, you're still a slave, mm -hmm. and you hear in your mind's ear the voice of your old slave master, mm -hmm. and you think, I have no choice, I've just got to do what he says. Now, if you're out in the wilderness, on the way home to the promised mm -hmm. land, it can get pretty rough in the wilderness, and as we know from the wilderness stories in the book of Exodus and so on, the people often behaved as if they were still in Egypt. Mm -hmm. But Moses was having to say to them, no, you're on your way home. You're going in a new direction. You don't live in Egypt anymore. Yes, you can remember that it was quite fun there because you had leeks and garlics and melons and goodness yeah. knows what instead of this manna to eat. And so the Christian has to say, I actually have come out of that. And that is, as you rightly say, a daily and hourly struggle mm. to, to, to live that way. And the Lord's Prayer, we need to say it every day, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them. But that is now a possibility mm -hmm. where before it would just be a nice hope. Yeah. I think one thing that, that can be difficult, I'm thinking mostly now about uh, young people that yeah. I know, teenage types, who might be able to grant everything that we've said here, uh, the importance of bodily resurrection, the um, convictions of the early Christians, the uh, fact that those convictions are woven into the New Testament in ways that without them, the New Testament makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And they would still be able to say, and I've actually been in discussions <coughs> that got rather heated around this point, <laughs> um, but they were wrong. They made a mistake. Mm. And if they listen to you talk about the people coming out of Egypt and being reminded that they were headed to a promised land, uh, they would be likely to say, uh, because this argument is not unfamiliar either, um, yes, but there really were people who remembered being in Egypt, yeah. and, and they and really and knew they weren't, and they had parents. Yes. And but it's different. What really changed with Jesus? Um, yeah. wh what can you point to, and what can you point yes. to? And yes. In yes. terms yes. of thinking about mission, and the story, that That's, is a hard It's very important. Thing. I think we have got so used in the late Western world to telling the story, us, and it's a Protestant problem as well, mm. to telling the story of the church as a story of failure and then God hopefully <coughs> doing a new thing. And now mm. in late Protestantism, we tell the story even of the Reformation as a very ambiguous mm. thing. Mm -hmm. And we're always deconstructing. We're pulling the house down on top of mm. ourselves. And there's a sense in which there is, yes, a necessary humility over against a sort of triumphalism that says, well, the church is just a great organization and that's mm -hmm. all to be said for it. I think there may be some people who still believe that, but I don't know too many of them. But having said all that, you know, there still are the St. Francis's, there still are the Mother Teresa's, there still are the Benedicts, there still are the, 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 the great people who are both humble and wise and healing and fruitful. And actually, most congregations have got a few of those, mm -hmm. at least, oh, yes. so that when you really get to know people and their stories, you find that there are great saints right under your nose. And precisely because they're often mm -hmm. very humble people, yeah. you can ignore them. And when we look at what the Roman Empire was like at the time of Jesus and Paul, and then what the Roman Empire was like under the Gospel, of course, when Constantine said the Roman Empire is now going to be officially a Christian, that was quite a problem and all sorts of compromises came in. But people started to think differently about the death penalty so that the, uh, some of the great theologians of the Roman Empire would tell the emperor off for executing people, say you shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. that. And that's not a compromise, you know, they had the, the freedom to do that. And the way that they cared for the sick Yes. And, and the mm -hmm. change in the status of women, the fact that they did, that men, uh, Christian men didn't force women either to have abortions or to abandon female children mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. There were all kinds of ways which as we look back now when we see it, there were real improvements and real changes. And I would instance the abolition of slavery in the 19th century as another one 
And I hope that in a few mm. years' time I'll be able to say that the success of the Jubilee 2000 movement mm -hmm. and the remission mm. of third world debt was something that came from the churches. It's certainly true that one of the main reasons the Berlin Wall fell was because the That's Pope, right. being Polish, said enough. Mm. And finally, you know, the whole thing came to And many down. of the meetings mm. that surrounded that took place in mm. churches Absolutely. in Germany. Uh, and, and also in Hungary and Romania and so yes. on. Yeah. It, is, it is true, and it's true in this country that to imagine the culture without the church oh, yes, yes. is to imagine such an impoverished culture. And I, I guess uh, another place where the church has been extraordinarily active is in the arts. Yes, and, and certainly patronizing them. Yes, that, that's certainly true, and, and thank God that continues. Um, I don't know much about what's going on in America, but certainly in the UK at the moment, there's a lot of Christian art and Christian music, and not at a trivial level either. Mm. I mean, the trivial stuff matters too, because mm -hmm. a lot of people who live there, but at a very serious, highly aesthetic level that this is going on, and that's marvelous. And one only has to think of some of the great music in the Christian tradition, like Bach, for instance, mm -hmm. to say, you know, this is just amazing to think that that didn't exist before, you know. Um, so, yeah, we shouldn't be too mealy-mouthed about what the gospel has done in the world, even while we should be very realistic about the tasks that still lie ahead of us. Because, you know, one of the things about the resurrection as the basis of all of this, mm. for me, is that when I'm engaged as I am in a project like Jubilee 2000, the remission of third world debt, I don't see this simply as we've got to persuade people to do this. I see it in terms of the principalities and powers, like the powers of economics mm. and yeah. the forces of mammon and all that, have been defeated on the cross. I know that because of Jesus' resurrection. I am now not doing a new thing. I am applying the victory of the cross to this situation and doing that in prayer and doing it symbolically in the Eucharist and so on. And that has a whole different feel about it from simply being yet another political pressure group. Although in some ways moot, I, I've been thinking all along since that Romans 12 about, oh, yes, yes. Uh, about having your mind transformed oh, yes, and yes. how many people seem to imagine that that's really what Jesus' resurrection is all about, that in some way it, it transformed some piece of us, the, the thinking oh, part. Oh, oh, oh. But even as we've talked about, mm. what, what evidence might there be that humankind as a people is moving toward another, another place with no particular mm. certainty mm. about mm. arrival, mm. I hasten mm. to say, yeah. as a Lutheran, <laughs> let alone <laughs> what it will look like. Um, uh, it's clear that we're talking about more than just uh, thinking. I yeah, wonder if yeah, you could say yeah. something about the way nous yeah. really yes, means. Yes, the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S, um, is w what is normally translated mind. And it's one of those difficult words. It doesn't occur that often in the New Testament, no. but it seems to carry quite a lot of freight when mm -hmm, it does. Yeah. And I think, again, in our post-18th century world, we think about thinking mm -hmm. in a very shrunken fashion. And we think that it really means that we've got a little computer inside our heads that is just processing certain amount of data, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's thinking. And I think Paul would say that by the mind, he means something much bigger and richer than this, and w which, I mean, clearly from Paul himself, it catches up the thinking processes. Paul is a thinker, mm -hmm. yes. but mm -hmm. he's a thinker on his feet, mm -hmm. and he's a thinker who is in love with God and in love with the world for God's sake, you know. And, and he is thinking in a new way because I think we can begin to see some of what he meant actually in his own life because he didn't, Paul was not unreflective about his Gentile mission. He didn't just sort of wake up one morning and say, I think I'll go and tell some of those Gentiles down the street. He had thought it through that mm -hmm. because of the crucified and risen Messiah, there was now a Gentile mission mm -hmm. and he was called to do it. But that set him free to do things and so I think the just as we've got a split in our world between facts and values and all that, so mm -hmm. we've got a split between thought and action. And sometimes we then talk about left brain, right brain, or head and heart, or whatever. And what we see in the New Testament is an integrated noose, an integrated mind, which is left and right together, head mm -hmm. and heart together, yes. um, head and feet together. Um, and then I really do think mm -hmm. there is a new way of knowing which is being known and loved by God and hence being set free to know and love one another in the world. Mm 
to relate appropriately to one another and to the world. Yeah. Because you yeah. see, at one level, there are many unthinking Christians to whom I want to say, yeah. you need to think harder. Yeah. You're just free floating. You're not using your yeah. God-given mind. But then there are many others in a sort of more rationalist tradition yeah. to whom I want to say, you know, yeah. you're, you're treating your mind as if it was just a computer. Loosen mm -hmm. up and let all the other bits come in. God made them and loves them. Mm -hmm. So it's a hard task. I love yeah. Luke's question, who is the wise and faithful yeah. steward? Yeah. And he uses both the thinking words and the word of uh -huh. faith together and holds them together in the answer because uh -huh. that steward uh -huh. ends up being the one who gives the other slaves their food at the right time. Well, when yes. you think big yes. about that, mm. uh, there's enormous uh, discernment and yes. thought and process that goes into mm. feeding people yes. on whatever metaphoric level. Yeah, and that yeah, is yeah. faith. Yeah. 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 It's, it's faith and it's yeah. wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm. E echoed in the great Christ in the Philippines who had yes. his mind yeah. amongst yep. yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, modeling Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it defines it can, thinking yeah. Yeah. by what Christ yes. does, right. exactly. which I think is really That's right. Intriguing. And of course, that's rooted directly in the Jewish wisdom tradition. Uh, where wisdom means everything from sort of knowing how to boil an egg uh -huh. through to knowing God, you know, uh -huh. everything in between, and knowing the names of the plants and the animals, that's wisdom, but also knowing how to relate within families and, and mm -hmm. work and so uh -huh. on. And, and all of that is wisdom. And somehow, as, it's another of the strands we haven't yet explored, but might just throw into the pot, that uh, for the Jewish wisdom tradition, there is this sense which comes to its height in the book Ben Sira, where wisdom says, where shall I go and live? And wisdom says, I know, I'll go and live in Israel. Wisdom comes and lives in the temple mm -hmm. as the revelation of the way it is for God's people. And that's a wonderful image which the New Testament then picks up on to say that's what happened in Jesus, yes. mm -hmm. God's wisdom becoming human. And so Jesus is God's thought becoming mm -hmm. human. And if you want to know what the word for mm -hmm. thought is, yeah. John would say logos, not just word, but word right. and idea mm -hmm. together. That the logos becoming human, dwelling in our midst, another temple image, and we beholding his glory, another temple mm -hmm. image. But then John picks that same logos image up, it doesn't use the word logos, in his resurrection account, when Thomas then says at the end, my Lord and my God. What Thomas is doing is recognizing the word, the wisdom become flesh. The wisdom of the world probably looks towards one uh, popular image of looking for the resurrection some proof and that's the Shroud of Turin. Oh yes, I wondered yes, if you yes. could just comment on that because <laughs> well, people are curious about that. They see it in the newspaper and yeah, the news yeah. all the time. Of course. Uh, about ten years ago, the scientists claimed that they disproved the Shroud of Turin because they took mm -hmm. a tiny little bit and ran a carbon dating test on it and they said it's a medieval forgery. Mm -hmm. Now, I have just read some stuff recently, people saying actually what they did was take some stuff which had some medieval overlay mm -hmm. on it, either mm -hmm. paint or bits of fibers or something, mm -hmm. and that's what the carbon dating picked up okay. because they found all sorts of odd things about it, like the, the image has mm -hmm. coins over its eyes, mm -hmm. which was uh, a Roman practice. We now know that's what they did with dead bodies. And the coins they've now got through X-ray techniques, mm. but they are Roman coins mm. of the right period. Mercy. Yeah, it's extraordinary, quite extraordinary. But I have to say, it's still quite possible, as far as I'm concerned, that it could be a very, very clever later forgery. I do know some people who have actually become Christians as a result of looking at the Shroud of Turin, studying mm. that. But even if that was, as it were, a mistake, and if it was a forgery, of course, what matters in that case is not that the bridge over which they got from the island they were on to the mainland was rickety, but that they mm -hmm. now live on the mainland, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say nothing hinges one way or the other. If we'd never heard of the Shroud of Turin, it really wouldn't matter. However, if it turned out that it really was a first century thing, even that wouldn't prove it was Jesus' shroud, mm -hmm. of course, but something very strange was going on, and some people like to believe, I, I wouldn't um, base any arguments on this, some people like mm -hmm. to believe that the way that image was produced on the shroud had something to do with the strange process of transformation mm. from one mode of physicality to another. Now that's stretching out a bridge too far mm. for, for me as a historian, but if that helps some people to sustain an argument reached uh, on other mm -hmm. grounds, so yeah. be it. For you as a historian, uh, did it did it come to your attention? And I can't think when 
but recently that there was an ossuary found oh. in Israel oh, yeah, yeah. that that did have bones yeah, and that yeah. was marked with a name that was like Oh yeah, they had something. It, it was actually in the in the press um, because the BBC made a program about it. It, it was a it was a Jesus, son of Joseph, and they found in the same tomb um, a, a Judas and a, a James a, mm -hmm. and a Joseph and mm -hmm. a, and a this and a that. And suddenly they were all saying, "Wow, maybe oh, maybe yeah, this yeah. is it." Yeah. And of course, the one set of people who weren't impressed were the Israeli archaeologists because they will tell you that there are hundreds Zillions, of them. Yes. These mm -hmm. are. This is like in England looking up Mr. Smith and Mrs. Jones in the telephone directory. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the American oh, equivalents right. might be. <laughs> um, different names, different areas, I guess. But um, in fact, they call the list of ossuaries the, the, the phone book in the Jerusalem mm -hmm. archaeology because they've got names and names and names, and these are the most common ones. Like mm -hmm. Mary is mm -hmm. far and away, Miriam, the most mm. common name. So it really didn't make a whole lot of difference. But I, I think it did highlight what for many people was news, what I was saying before, that the burial was designed to be a two-stage yes. burial. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. would have had to come back, fold up the bones, put them in an ossuary, mm -hmm. and then the game would have been up. Somebody would have said, oh, so he really was dead. Yeah. Mm. Son of a gun, here he yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Tom, a lot of the talk we've been having this afternoon, I think, has to do with what goes on on Sundays. Mm -hmm. um, a, a pastor may preach on it, uh, hopefully. Uh, Bible studies will be taught about it. But what about Monday through Saturday as we live in the world? What does the resurrection, mm. how can we continue to hear that promise that Jesus did raise from the dead, mm. is alive, a new mm. kingdom is here? Mm. Any handles that we can bring into our workplace, our home, and our neighborhood right, schools? Right, right. That, that's, of course, one of the most important questions. I mean, Paul talks about basically all of life being prayed life. Mm -hmm. Pray constantly. The thought for Paul that you just worshipped or prayed on mm -hmm. a Sunday would mm -hmm. be absolute anathema. You know, this is something you do all the time. And we, we, I, I do believe we need sacred time. We need times when we orient ourselves again and consciously take time and space to do that. But you see, there's that lovely promise from one of the darkest books in the Old Testament, Lamentations, about God's mercies being new every morning. Mm. That is a resurrection image. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, in the prayer book that the cathedral where I used to work uses in the mornings, there's a lovely prayer um, which says, as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. Mm. And, and for me, as I use that, as I now do in my private prayers at the moment, um, day by day, that is an astonishing piece of the resurrection, mm. symbolized by the rising sun, S-U-N, mm. which is, of course, in many branches of Christianity, the image of the rising mm. sun, S-O-N. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is God's visual aid to mm -hmm. say to us every morning, the resurrection matters today mm -hmm. as much as ever it did, Monday, Tuesday, whatever, just as much as Sunday, if not more, and that we are to live each day in the light of the rising sun, mm -hmm. and that by that light we will see clearly to walk all the day through until the day dawns, a good place to wrap this all up, I guess, when, as Revelation says, uh, in the new city, the new Jerusalem, they won't need any sun or moon any longer because that's the point at which God's visual aid becomes reality mm -hmm. and the rising sun of God replaces the rising sun, S-U-N, of the world and the Lord Jesus will be the light of that city forever. That's what we're looking forward to and in the light of that, we are now living and working, please God, to his praise and glory. Mm -hmm.